Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start the YouTube stream. Uh, so I just ask that everyone be quiet until I give the uh, the okay sign for it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council meeting, the first meeting of 2021. It's January 21st, 10 a.m. And uh, normally when we meet in person, we go around the room and do introductions, but to keep things simple, I'll just read the list of current attendees. And as people add or join, I will try to mention their names. So just looking at the list in front of me, we have today uh, myself, I'm Bert Lay, I'm chair and also chair of the Waters Committee, um, being joined by Clint Brunson. Clint is a fisheries biologist from the Northern region. Dave Bahunin is a council representative from Southern Utah, the Southern region. Uh, George Weekly, our vice chair joins us. Uh, George is our at one of our, uh, I believe, three at-large representatives. We're joined by Jackie Watson, fisheries biologist from the central region. Jordan Nielsen is uh, our representative for southeastern Utah. Ken Strong is joining us. Ken is our central region representative. Working the uh, magic of the media is Michael Christensen. Thanks for getting us going, Mike, with our YouTube recording. We're also joined by Mike Fisher. Mike is our commercial fishing representative. I see somebody with the name Montana Cabin. I'm not entirely who that is. Sorry, I'll change it. It's Brian Anderson. <laughs> All right, Brian Anderson is calling in from his Montana cabin site. Uh, Brian is a new uh, cold water representative, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, correct. We're also joined by Natalie Boren, fisheries biologist from the Northeastern region. Uh, I just saw Mount Nebo goats. I think that was Rex, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, boy, you guys are messing me up this morning. We're joined by Nick Braithwaite, who is a fisheries biologist uh, from the southern region. Joined by Randy Opplinger, sport fish coordinator for the Division of Wildlife Resources, and also um, our liaison with the division. Joined by Rex Infanger, and Rex is uh, a warm water representative mm -hmm. We're joined also by Russ Lawrence, and Russ is our Northern Region representative. And then last on the list that I see here is TJ Tsokolos, and TJ is an at-large representative as well. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Happy New Year. Uh, looking forward to having a productive New Year with Blue Ribbon. Um, and so normally we move on from this point. Uh, first of all, were there any uh, Questions, concerns, additions, people that I missed out on. Uh, looks like Cal Black has joined us. Cal is a fisheries biologist from the southeastern region. Any other comments from the council? Okay, moving on on the agenda. We do not have minutes to approve. Uh, we still need minutes from our October meeting and our November meeting. We did not meet in December. Um, but when we get those I from Lindy, I will circulate those to everyone for your review and approval. Um, we now move into regional reports. And I'm not sure if Ben Kurtz has joined us. Ben is our representative 
uh, from the Northeastern region, but Natalie Boren is here, and hopefully Natalie will be ready to tell us what's going on in the Northeastern region. Natalie, take it away. Wow, well, I get to go first, lucky. It's been a minute. All right, let me pull up some notes here. Sorry to catch you off guard there. <laughs> it's all good, I'm ready for everything, right? Okay, so we'll start with some work going on at Starvation Reservoir. Um, we're still working on the bioenergetics project. That's a collaborative project between the Northeastern region and Fisheries Experiment Station. Right now we have pretty much analyzed all the uh, age, the spines from smallmouth bass, yellow perch, and walleye that we collected from July of last year all the way up through our fall walleye index netting. We've also analyzed diets and we are starting to put all that data together. Um, the project will continue through July for the field work and data collection. And the analysis and report writing is scheduled to be completed by the end of January, 2022. Um, we have a really good start on it though. So there's some cool data that we can extrapolate for some of our management teams. Um, when we send out some emails to the starvation management team, uh, some of that data will be inserted into there. Uh, we have a winter diet collection attempt coming up next week at starvation. So really there, throughout the country, there has not really been much diet collection through the winter months for walleye in particular. Um, so this is kind of a novel attempt to try to get some of that information uh, to go in our bioenergetics model. So next week, starting the 25th, we're gonna begin at uh, Night Hollow. And we are going, going to work in some small groups and try to get some walleye on the ice, do some diet collections from them. We know we can get some rainbow trout diet collections, but walleye is gonna be tricky. Um, fishing at starvation has been difficult this winter so far. Ice has been forming extremely uh, weirdly this year. So there was a lot of discrepancies in ice conditions throughout the lake, but it's fairly stable now. Um, so we're gonna be out there next week. If anybody really wants to get out and help us, uh, please let me know after this and I'll get you all the details. So we'll likely have a spring walleye population estimate in conjunction with our uh, small one week walleye spawn that's gonna occur at starvation. And that walleye spawn will specifically be obtaining triploid walleye fry for Big Sand Wash Reservoir. That will happen April and the, it'd be the middle of April that that walleye spawn and marking event is gonna occur. Then the last piece of our puzzle for starvation bioenergetics work is the hydroacoustic survey, which we have an HT, HTI workshop coming up in June that's gonna be in Vernal. And right after that workshop, we hope to do the hydroacoustic surveys and verify them with some nettings. We do have a preliminary forage netting info sheet that I just finalized last night. It's about ready to go out, but we did have a increase in our uh, yellow perch, a drastic increase. And I will say it may be a little bit biased because I've been trying to dial this in on timing and location for four years now but we did have a significant jump in catch per unit effort for yellow perch um, age one and young of year. So that was good to see. I'm just not quite sure um, how it's gonna directly correlate to some of those uh, earlier days that we started attempting this forage netting. So we are gonna have uh, a lot of stuff going on at starvation all the way through July. Um, that's basically all I have for starvation. Does anybody have any questions about starvation? Okay, hearing none, I will move on to lower Stillwater ponds. So myself and my technician, whose name is Ben, we were able to ice fish the lower Stillwater ponds um, early in December. Uh, the earliest I've ever ice fished there, actually, December 3rd. Uh, we caught some really nice browns, six browns total. Um, the biggest was 20 inches. We caught 10 rainbows and a brookie. 
So really a neat place. We will be asking for some blue ribbon funding and our proposals coming up to begin a lower Stillwater Ponds Creel Survey, which would start on July 1st, 2021, um, fiscal year 2022. No creel data has ever been collected for lower Stillwater Ponds. So this type of a survey greatly helps us with future management, um, knowing some harvest, knowing some angler hours and effort. It would be a good survey to get done coming up. Um, lower Stillwater, oh, that's it for Lower Stillwater. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Natalie, uh, so I, given the unique situation at Lower Stillwater um, and the council having approved it a couple of years ago, um, we um, we had this dream that the different ponds could be managed for different species. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if that's naive, given that there are flowing water connections between at least some of the ponds that I saw. But um, in your survey, did you just focus on one pond? Or I guess, can you speak generally to what is the likelihood that different ponds could be managed for different species? Is that something that the region is looking to pursue? And has that been borne out in the ice fishing surveys you just did? So it's already happening. Um, we have a pond that's specifically a cutthroat pond. We have a pond that's specifically a tiger trout pond. We have a pond that's specifically a brown trout pond. So there are three ponds that are basically managed with different species already. Um, the pier pond, it is the one that's kind of the family kids fishery type thing where we stock a lot of rainbow trout there. And we also, to my surprise, when we netted it a few, few years ago, we had a trophy tiger trout in that same pier pond. I mean, 12 pound tiger trout came out of the pier pond. So, Hourglass Pond is the big pond that everything kind of flows to in the middle. That one ends up being the catch-all, and that's where you're going to have browns, brookies, um, tigers, rainbow trout, mountain whitefish, and anything else that can basically get in through that system. So it's already occurring. The ice fishing that I did about a month ago, well, the early December, that was just a single event. What we have coming up for our Creel surveys or our angler surveys, that will be the more intensive six to eight days per month for about nine to 10 months until snow cuts off access to the ponds in the winter. So that would be a completely different survey than we've done in the past. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. I wonder if it's also naive for me to think you could do electroshocking there. I'm not sure how that might work on a pond situation, but any thoughts? Um, we've just traditionally used gill nets because there is no, there's no way for me to launch an electrofishing boat except for a raft set up, which we don't really have set up for our region except for on the river systems. So we have it as a rotation. I think it's done every three years for our surveys, for actual gill net surveys. And then, like I said, the krill survey has never been done. So it's going to be a high priority for us to get that completed this next year if we can. And how intensive, this is actually a question also regarding, well, all of the fisheries. Have you seen an uptick in ice fishing um, in your region and how intense is ice fishing pressure on, you've mentioned starvation so far, but still water, I'm curious about that too. Um, absolutely, we've seen, it, seen an increase in ice fishing. Um, there's certain waters, it really depends on how hard people want to work for a fish. I mean, Steinecker has been absolutely bombarded this year. There have been more people than I have ever remembered in my entire lifetime on Steinecker. But you get Red Fleet where you have a different species composition and you have to work a lot harder to find the fish. There's not as many people. Um, I've only been up to lower still water twice when it had ice and the time I was there, there was another group fishing, and um, the time I drove past it, I saw two other ice anglers. So for me, that signals an uptick, but we don't have enough historic information to go back and say, this is an increase, especially on lower stillwater ponds. That's why we need to do this initial krill survey to get some of this baseline information. But overall in our region, yes, we've had some pretty intense pressure for ice fishing. 
all around. Great, thanks. Hey, Natalie, right, so, this is yep. George. I, I went and fished uh, Lower Stillwater this past summer, and I was shocked at the number of people that were showing up uh, compared to previous years. It was a magnitude more people than I've ever seen at Lower Stillwater. Yes, and I wish I could record some of that pressure estimate that we just experienced <laughs> with the COVID bump. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like next year, but I anticipate that we're we're not going to see a huge decrease in people getting out and recreating in our fisheries. It's, they've begun to love it like I think the rest of us have, and we'll see what it turns into, but I think we're going to see it again, honestly. Yeah. All right, so I'll move on to Calder real quick. I've actually spent several times uh, personally ice fishing it this last couple months, this last month, actually. Um, I have fished it twice so far. Uh, the water level is good. We moved water from Matt Warner down to Calder again, just like we did last year. Um, so far, dissolved oxygen levels are looking good. We have two of the Two of the six aeration systems are working and keeping large holes open in the ice. But much to my surprise, um, the ice fishing has been exceptionally good considering that I have not used any bait. I promise I have not cheated one time. Um, but I mean, my tech, Ben and I and Trenna were up for from one to about 4.30 on an evening and we ended up icing 15 fish. Um, the biggest was 21 inches. They were all big and healthy and nice. Uh, a few of the smaller ones that we stocked at three inches showed up, but they are looking really good. Um, a couple of reports of anglers catching a tiger trout or two out of there. No one that I know has caught a brown out of there yet, but fingers crossed that that is gonna make it through the winter again, and we're gonna have some beautiful fish coming out of there all next season. Um, Matt Warner's a, a bigger concern because the water levels are very low there and dissolved oxygen levels are significantly different from Calder to Matt Warner already. We're talking about eight milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen at Calder and 4.5 at Matt Warner. And that was just a week ago. So interesting stuff going on. We need to uh, hope for some moisture though, or we are gonna be in extremely bad shape on our Diamond Mountain Lakes. Any questions on Calder? Uh, Natalie, this is Russ. I, I uh, how is access to Calder during the winter? With, yeah, with no snow, it's fine. I've driven to it twice with no four wheel drive. Usually by this time I am snowmobiling in there to check the dissolved oxygen levels. So we're hopeful that this storm coming in tomorrow and Saturday brings us something. We need something bad, but most of the time you cannot get all the way up into Calder and Matt Warner um, when we have a good snowpack year and it's snowmobile access only. Thank you. All right, moving on to Lake Canyon. Um, I sent my tech over last week to do some dissolved oxygen readings um, and collect some information on how the fishing was. Uh, DO levels look good at uh, Lake Canyon between seven to nine milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen all the way down to the bottom, which is great. He was able to catch 10 uh, cutthroat and he lost a pretty big tiger through right at the ice hole. That's terrible to lose one right there when you can see it that close, but he lost it. Um, but I mean, we've definitely seen an increase and I've heard of an increase of angler use there, even with the um, no bait rule. So good things happening still there um, and a lot of pressure and then Obviously, Brian and Garn will move in there in the springtime and start doing some uh, cutthroat spawning operations. But that's it for Lake Canyon. Any questions on Lake Canyon? Hey, Natalie, this is, um, you mentioned doing um, dissolved oxygen measurements. Are, are those all in situ, or do you guys have some dissolved oxygen data loggers that you put out? I wish I had dissolved oxygen data loggers. I do not. That's just using my handheld tool and measuring through the water column. So we, we bought some data loggers to measure oxygen on the Boulder Mountains where we have where we have the aerators. 
And at the time, they were about $1,000 a piece, um, which is a little pricey, but they've been awesome. I mean, basically, that's how we learned our oxygen issues weren't during the winter. They were right at ice off. Um, we got so much mixing and anoxic water mixing with other water. That's where our problem was. Anyway, if you have a way, you can scrounge up some money. They've, they've been really useful for us. I've thought about it several times, and for some reason, I just need to purchase them, need to put them in the plan and get them purchased for some of these locations. Um, it's really nice to have a winter tech, though, right now. I've never had a technician on during the winter, and I can send them out to do all sorts of things, so it's kind of cool. Um, moving on to some other notable items from some of our region. Um, we conducted a, what I called a wiper hunt at Cottonwood Reservoir on January 4th. There was nine people out on the ice that day, and our goal was to ice a wiper at Cottonwood. Um, there really has been no reports. Uh, very few people have tried it. Um, they think they get really discouraged about it. Um, but our goal was to try to ice some wiper and promote what we were able to do. So it took us quite a long time. Um, amazingly enough, about 20 minutes after I got there, I hooked into about a 24 inch tiger muskie and got it all the way up. And that was the first fish of the day was a 24 inch tiger muskie. We, no one had a bite for the next four hours. We drilled probably 250 holes throughout the reservoir. And finally, my technician had a school of wiper come through suspended about 30 feet, and he was able to pick one of them up. And all of us that were left for the day, we moved over to this one section of the reservoir and started drilling holes. And he ended up picking up 10 wiper for the day. Soon as I switched to something, a pattern that he had on and the same type action that he was doing, I picked up three wiper and Ben Kurtz picked up another single wiper. Um, so we ended up with 14 wiper through the ice for the day, which in our eyes was a huge win because we had never been able to specifically target them and catch them through the ice. Um, I think one person has been able to go out and replicate and catch a few through the ice, but I don't know how many have tried it, but it might be something that we look into in the future as an outreach because we have plenty of wiper in Cottonwood and with the limits going down from six to three, we need some harvest there. And it's a really underutilized fishery, but pretty neat. Um, the other guy from the hatchery also caught a muskie that day, about a 22 inch muskie. They looked great, but that's a pretty cool thing that we were able to figure out on Cottonwood. So if that's on your bucket list, get a hold of me and we'll uh, try to get you out there sometime and figure it out. Any questions on that? Natalie, yeah. Natalie, this is Rex. Um, were you able to get any video of, is it something we could get passed on to Mike and, and put that out from outreach out on our on our website or, or, or no video or any pictures, anything that we might be able to put out from outreach? Yeah, so I got, I got photographs and I was specifically, it was, cold and a very long day. I think we spent eight hours out there and it was negative four when we got there. So I have pictures. I didn't get the camera out because everything was freezing solid. Um, but I do have pictures and we, we could try it. I'm sort of hesitant because um, I, I want to be able to go out and recreate what happened before I pass it on to everybody. But I did do some outreach here locally and try to get some others to go out and try it. Um, we can. I think it's something that's kind of neat that people would like to try, and it's a bucket list item, I believe. So we can definitely get something out. Once you're comfortable with it, would you mind reaching out and let's let's see what we can do? Because that'd be something neat to have on the on the on our division's website that people are catching yeah. wipers. And you know, once we put that out there, I think we could get some interest for you. So I just let me know what we can do from our side, please. Cool. Sounds good. You might also want to share your secrets with other divisions and maybe members of the council. I was trying to catch a wiper at East Canyon and failed uh, uh, this past weekend. So 
So quickly, I'll, I'll give you the, the secret that we used. So the secret was a quarter or an eighth ounce um, Northland buckshot. And the pattern had to be like a gold perch pattern. And it had to be tipped with a mealworm. And it was almost like once we figured it out, like they were in the area and you almost had to jig that enough that you were kind of calling them in. So that rattle inside there would draw their attention and they would come in and they would look at it. And then at that point you had to take that up above them. You could not drop it down into the dirt. As soon as you drop it down into the bottom sediments and stirred that up, the wiper would scatter. It's almost like they thought it was a muskie or something. I don't know exactly, but as soon as you started pulling that up above them and got them to chase it a little bit, then they would nail it. So I tried a pink color, I tried a white color. The only other thing we could catch one on, and Ben Kurtz caught it on, just a single millworm suspended dead stick. And that was it. Just like it was cruising and it came up and ate. But the other ones, you all you almost had to like lure them in, call them in and get them to react to that and bite. So we learned a lot about wiper that day, which was awesome, but I need to be able to replicate it. And I wanna to try to replicate it at Red Fleet as well, but I just haven't had the time. So there's your secret of the day. Thank you. Broadcast to the world now too on YouTube. All right, moving on to Pelican. I think you guys are probably interested in what's going on at Pelican. Um, Water levels are coming up. Uh, it appears that the fishing is picking up there as well. We were able to go out and ice 10 bass just in the afternoon. The biggest was about 14 inches. Fun, nice, healthy. You had to move around a lot, but they were active. Um, it's loaded with small bluegill. There's larger schools of bluegill, um, the larger size class coming through. And uh, it's coming along as the water's coming up, but one of our goals this winter was to try to figure out how to catch a carp through the ice so we could promote it, but there's just not enough time for this much ice fishing, unfortunately. I wish there was. Um, I got a call the other day. There's no ice or very little ice up in the upper Midwest. Um, a guy named Dave Gintz wants to come down and fish pelican in February. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he's kind of kind of a big deal in the bluegill fishing world. So we'll see if we can get him down here um, and hooked up on some of these broodstock bluegill. We have a Pelican Lake management team meeting coming up on the 9th of February. Um, some of you are a part of that. If you would like to be a part of that or listen in, let me know and we can send you the link. We're currently working with the Salt Lake staff and FES to kind of rework our management plan to unfortunately include a carp management component to this fishery. Um, we have some significant data that we need to collect sooner rather than later to try to figure out how much mortality between um, natural mortality and basically mechanical, mechanically inflicted mortality on carp to keep them at the levels they are now or deplete them in the long term. So. We have a lot of stuff going on there right now with how to move forward with the carp management perspective of this. We also have a little bit of money remaining um, from EPA 319 money that I'm gonna begin a habitat project and sediment control project with at Pelican. It is basically using kind of a, a marine technology. It's these are concrete structures called reef balls. They are used to create living shorelines and wave breaks in marine environments. I'm going to try to use some of this funding left over from the canal fix that fell through um, to reduce in lake sediment and erosion control on the south shoreline where we have completely exposed shorelines with no bulrush that grows on them. I'm also gonna try to incorporate a habitat component into this. As the water comes up and covers these structures, it should provide some really neat fish habitat that we don't have um, in our state for these fish. So that'll be coming around after I see if I can get the Army Corps permit 
approved, which has already been submitted. So I'm just waiting on that. I do have a request for Blue Ribbon to think about. Um, it's likely that we will have a little bit of Blue Ribbon internship money remaining um, in the estimated amount about $3,000. With this technician that I have on board right now, which is funded by the Blue Ribbon Tech money that you guys provided, I have I don't really need an intern for the spring this year. So I'm trying to figure out if you guys would be okay with me using the remaining $3,000 in that intern fund to purchase radio telemetry tags to be placed in adult carp in Pelican Lake so I can track them for the next several years and use that technology to be able to pinpoint and remove spawning carp congregations and also figure out if I can remove carp through the ice when supposedly they school up in really big schools and just hang out underneath the ice. So that is a request I have for you guys to think about. Um, we can discuss it later. There's a lot going on at Pelican Lake. Um, an update on the Brent McNee project. Uh, this was going to be a memorial fishing pier. It's kind of morphed into more like a casting deck type thing, sort of similar to what we've built at Old Fort Ponds. Um, the thing I want to relay to you guys is um, I have asked for comments. I've asked for uh, approval from someone from our local rec department of the BLM. Um, and I've been asking for this for over a year now to move this project forward. I have received pretty much nothing as far as comments or approval. Um, the funding deadline obviously is now passed to submit a Habitat Council Blue Ribbon project to have this happen in fiscal year 22. So I'm sort of on a waiting list, I guess. I don't know how to put it any nicely, more nicely, that I just can't get the project moving forward and there doesn't feel like a whole lot that I can do about it right at this moment. So everything's in place, it's ready to go. I'm ready to pursue the funding to do the construction. I just can't get anything else moved forward with our local office. So that's the update on that. I'm not gonna give up on it. I will keep trying and hopefully at some point we can get that recreation crew to to buy into what we're trying to do and complete this project. Natalie, this is Rex again. Randy, would it be appropriate or can we even be involved and just send a letter from Blue Ribbon request? It just, hey, we're aware of this project. We've been willing to put money into it. Just wondering what the status is. There's something we could do that maybe push the rock a little bit down the hill. Looks like Randy just got back on. He might not have heard what you said. I did hear what you said. I went to unmute my mic and pressed hang up instead. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, Rex, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. I think that probably is a good idea in this case and a good use for us to, to kind of push that a little bit to, to kind of advocate an angle cause here in the state. Natalie, if you have something maybe that you'd kind of like some wording or something on, if you could pass it to us and we could move forward with that. that I, this is a project you've worked hard on. We, you, we're certainly behind you. What can we do to help? I appreciate that. It's just one of those frustrating things in life, I think, that we've had a lot of changeover in the regional office here for the rec people, and we just need to get a little bit more, a little bit more pressure, I think, on it. But I do think, yeah, it's a good project. I have anglers asking me about it all the time. Um, I'd love to move it forward. It's in the position to be moved forward. And I really think if things would have worked out this year, it would have been built by the end of the, the next fiscal year and ready for people to use. So it's one of those frustrating things in life that we all encounter and hopefully we can keep it rolling. But yes, I'll get you something for that. And then just a couple more quick items here. Um, Steinecker is having and hosting a really large ice addiction tournament on January 23rd, so Saturday. Um, it's anticipated to be 400 to 600 anglers on the morning. Um, I'll send you guys some pictures. There's also one coming up at Echo on January 6th if the ice holds. It's a really cool tournament that we had at uh, Starvation last year. 
and uh, we'll see what it all brings, but I think it'll be really good for our community. You guys know the Burbot Bash is coming up the 29th through the 31st, I believe are the dates on those. Um, Ryan sent down some ice condition reports. Um, the north end seems to be fairly stable ice conditions, um, but it's very slick and there are many pressure ridges that have formed in several locations. Um, Ryan is definitely emphasizing being extra careful this year for anyone participating in the Burbot Bash. Um, we'll see what this next storm brings. Maybe it'll get some uh, snow on the ice, but I don't know. He's very, very slick conditions and somewhat difficult this year. Um, as you guys have probably noticed, there's a lot of big lake trout coming out of Flaming Gorge from boats this winter. I think it's really starting to catch on. There's several guides that are um, going out and several locals that are pulling big lakers out of Flaming Gorge uh, from boats. I think that maybe some of them have ditched the ice fishing thing up there and found someone with a boat and they're going out and utilizing the nice weather with, that we're having. And they are really capitalizing on some really big, beautiful lake trout. So, I believe that's about all I have from our region. It was plenty long, I think. If anybody has questions, please let me know. If you'd like to help with starvation next week, let me know. Otherwise, that's what I have. Thank you, Natalie. I did want to follow up regarding candidate waters. We'll talk more about these this afternoon. Um, in fact, Red Fleet is the only water for the council to review and evaluate this year. Red Fleet is a moderate still water, cold. I guess Natalie's reported probably the best time to visit is June or in the fall, September through early October. And uh, we'll say more about it. Did you want to say anything more about your uh, future candidates, Steinecker and Pelican? I know uh, you have some thoughts about when you would like the council to review them. Yeah, I think. Steinecker is moving along nicely. Um, it is really rebounding well. Uh, we have, our last survey showed that we have really good condition and growth for our bluegill. Our bass are coming along nice. The trout are growing good. Um, the browns are gonna take a little bit longer to get going, but I think I would be comfortable uh, revisiting that status. I mean, it got removed from the blue ribbon fisheries list because of the repair project and the ultimate winter um, dissolved oxygen problem and the fish kill that we had because of it. So I would think in two years, um, we could put that back on the list to evaluate. Uh, I would hate to go a little bit too soon. It just needs a little bit of time to rebuild, but it is looking great. Um, our local anglers are loving it. I've had many, many positive reports of Steinecker and its rebuild. Pelican, um, I would say two to three years out, I think the bass are going to progress faster than the bluegill at this point, but I'm really interested to see what kind of growth we get for our muskie there as well. I mean, we could be looking at a trophy muskie fishery along with really quality bass and some quality bluegill. Um, the carp obviously throws a giant wrench in this whole project, but I think that by our, uh, the end of our Pelican Lake management team meeting, we'll have a good idea of how we want to move forward with this thing. And we will have some outreach and promotions to try to have anglers of bow fishing, all sorts of different types of things occur there as we move forward. And we might even pursue a commercial type, Utah Lake type thing, maybe if we test these fish and they can come back um, without contaminants. So if there's an industry for this species, um, we may try to pursue something like that. But there's lots of ideas on the table right now. We just need to really dial them in and see how this is all gonna progress. But really the biggest thing that we need for our region is water. We need snowpack and we need rain and we need our fisheries to, to fill up and maintain. So that's what I would say about those two for the next several years. Okay, it looks like Jackie Watson has a question for you, Jackie. Thanks, Bert. Um, Natalie, I just wanted to mention that uh, for your carp removal under the ice, 
Uh, the Utah Lake commercial fisheries guys use a really high tech technique, which they just drive around and drill test holes looking for high turbid areas. And that indicates the congregations. Um, but I just emailed you the contact for the head of Loy Fisheries, which is our commercial fisherman on Utah Lake. He contacted me a few months ago and their carp removal on Utah Lake has gotten so slow that they're looking to get involved in other projects. So it might be worth reaching out to him and see if he'd come up and take a look around and if they could help. Yeah, that would be great. At this point, um, like I said, all tools are in the toolbox and I hope to find a combination of the best ones to move forward with this. But I love that high tech technique though. That's, that's good stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. And uh, maybe to add on to that a little bit too, Natalie, um, I know Dale and Keith in the Central Region have also been uh, purchasing some some dual sonic tags and um, and um, uh, Jackie, help me here, um, radio telemetry tags uh, to track Northern Pike, and so. Um, you may want to reach out to them and maybe see if there's a, a purchase discount if you guys are wanting to, to purchase those kind of tags for tracking carp. Definitely. And I think that's what uh, Randy brought up in our meeting last week was that contact. Randy or Craig brought one of those guys up. Okay, good. Yeah, it'd be nice to engage uh, Tiger Muskie Inc. as well, or maybe even form a new chapter out there in the Northeastern region. Any further questions for Natalie? All right, well, hearing none, we'll move on to the Northern region. And I know we have both Clint and Russ on the line. At least I believe Clint is here. So not sure which one of you, who, whom of you will take it over, but go ahead. Hey, sorry, I just have everything turned off, um, turning everything back on. It's working from home today, so. Um, mine's kind of brief. Uh, we have the Cisco Disco this weekend uh, at Bear Lake. I'm gonna go up and help Scott um, run their master or their monster uh, bait competition. Uh, which is our Bonneville Cisco, uh, our Bear Lake Cisco uh, contest. I'll do that. Um, they still have most of the things to do. So uh, if you have like Thursday or Friday, Saturday or Sunday, and you want to go up and, and go to the disco, there's lots of activities there. Um, fishing has been uh, really, really good. Uh, kind of similar uh, to Natalie's report, they're catching some really big cutthroats and uh, lake trout. Uh, yeah, boat right now, Bear Lake again is not froze this year. Um, it's been several years since they've had an ice cap on it, um, which probably reduces a lot of the fishing pressure um, that you would get with some ice, but uh, they're running a creel survey right now that is doing very, very well. Um, they had a 31 and a half or a 31 inch cutthroat that was caught and released it should break the state record um, up there at bear lake this last week whether it's turned in or not i don't know but anyways uh pretty cool um pine view is froze Clint, yeah. this is rex would you go i i is uh at cisco beach tomorrow on friday uh is is that where they'll be trying to catch some cisco and stuff so just go up from lake town and uh, what is it eight ten miles up there to cisco beach right yeah just yeah it's north of first and second second point probably where you were chasing whitefish with him it's just yeah. farther north right on the idaho line um, so they get a lot of guys that will come in from idaho and and uh fish this time of year to get a big bait supply for fishing the rest of the year um i think the limit's still 30 um for cisco but they've do, been doing really well guys are already catching cisco in the boat uh talked to scott on tuesday 
um, and he's going to be spending a little time uh, this this week uh, getting enough Cisco to do their deep fry that he does there early in the morning at like six o'clock. So, um, any other questions on Bear Lake? What what's the timing tomorrow, Clint? I mean, do you have to be there at O dark thirty or you for for the Cisco part? You need to be. Um, I think they'll start right as it gets light. Um, Scotty will be there prior to, you know, he'll be there in the dark on Saturday morning, getting everything ready. Saturday um, morning, Friday, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is just a bunch of activities through the day in the community. Um, okay. So I think it's Bear Lake, uh, Bear Lake Monster Fest.com. So you could just Google Bear Lake Monster Fest and and see all of the activities but his cisco disco part is saturday morning um when they he does a big uh cisco fry um there at cisco beach and they usually will start right at light the fish will run until you know maybe eight o'clock and then he's usually over at the marina at nine and participating with a bunch of others in chili cook off and other events that they're going to have so it's a it's a pretty neat little place. It should be. I don't know what weather's going to do. Um, when Nally said there was snow, I'd really like to see it because I've got about a whole two inches that I've had fall here all winter. Uh, I think I almost have buds breaking on my trees right now because they're thinking it's springtime. So, um, but if nobody has any other questions on Bear Lake, I'll jump to uh, Pine View. Uh, <clears throat> the plan is to probably put some more structures in Pine View, uh, either in the south arm or the north arm. Uh, we've got some in the middle fork arm, and we've got some in the south arm already. These are structures that Blue Ribbon has provided the region some money to purchase and build structures that are to um, protect young a year perch and crappies from predation when the lake turns over in the fall these fish usually stay below the hypolimnium or that oxygen level and uh, they actually do really really well but as soon as water turns over in the fall and mixes uh, allows bigger fish to predate on them and so we've been slowly trying to get these structures with approval from the core and we were basing into all of our rivers reservoirs um, that have perch and crappies in them. Um, and, and the goal there is to have enough in the future to kind of alleviate maybe some of this, these big boom and bust cycles and protect enough fish from year to year that we'll just continue to have uh, fish go through that cycle. So, um, but it's froze, guys are catching some crappies. Um, I had a buddy reach out to me on Saturday. They he had like a milk crate full of crappies. Him and I guess his brother and some others. I went up on Monday with my kids and did not go to that location because there's about 300 tents sitting about right where he was fishing. So um, our pressure is absolutely incredible this year on our reservoirs. Uh, it's been a tent city from the middle of December on Manaway and Echo. You know every time a place freezes, people are out on there. You know, and and it was nuts on Monday. It was crazy. Um, everybody must have posted their pictures from Saturday and Sunday, and everybody else that had Monday off went to went there. So um, it's it's been pretty pretty busy um, through the ice. There's been more people on the ice at Willard than I've ever seen, um, probably in the last 15 years combined. Just sitting in the marina or just outside the marinas this year. Just there are just people everywhere. Um, and as far as projects, uh, I have the second phase of the Judd project all complete. I do have some seating and some cuttings left to do this spring. Um, that was funded by Blue Ribbon. Um, I have the restroom that will go in probably in April, first part of May into Lost Creek. And, uh, that one's just froze about two weeks ago completely. Uh, Cody went up and caught some really nice fish there through the day. Um, so right now, a lot of us are, are writing reports and getting things done, getting ready for WRI, 
um, on all the proposals and stuff. We have a big one here in the region with Trout Unlimited and a bunch of other partners that is a Weber watershed wide project. And I think we'll be, we'll be, the numbers will scare you when you see the, the numbers for proposals. Um, it's not six figures. I think we'll be, we'll be close to seven figures by the time we pull in Ogden City's project. And we have a $1 million project that we're proposing just for one irrigation diversion. So um, it's, it's kind of crazy, but it's what we've been asked to do by DEQ and water quality and uh, Department of Ag put it all together. And if we get this and they said that they had funded, so we put it together, we'll see if it gets funded. <laughs> um, but it also make it really crazy and really busy. Um, other than that, uh, I really don't have anything else. We're, like I said, we're, um, we're going to be putting in structures this spring from funding that you gave to, to Kent, to Sorno, uh, this last year. So we're, he's got all the materials ordered and it's sitting in our warehouse. Um, and if you guys want to participate, I can let you know when we're pushing pipes into cold plastic and you can get a good hand workout. Makes you sore. You can't tie flies for about two weeks. Hands hurt too much. So, um, other than that, uh, for those that like to catch, uh, kokanee, we have put kokanee in East Canyon, Rockport and Lost Creek. And so we will start doing, we're going to make some changes. We just talked about this yesterday, starting to make changes on going to curtain nets and bodies of water that we have kokanee so we can sample those and see number wise, how that that's going to go. Um, because like strawberry and all of their standard nets, they never caught kokanee in their standard nets for 30, 40 years, but their curtain nets show what they've got. And so we're slowly making that transition. Um, we'll transition that for the next three years in our sampling with some standard gill nets and, and curtain nets. But anyways, I'm super excited about that. I think Cody and Chris are, are way excited to see how this will change our management and and if we have to make changes uh actually looking at doing some zooplankton toes on some of these lakes and getting some baseline data before these kokanee really get big and and have the potential of eating themselves and and competing with rainbows or or chubs in some of these places um as they're really good filter feeders so um some of that stuff was still to come but we're excited and and I'll give you a data when we start collecting that. I think it'd be pretty interesting to see how how that changes and what that looks like. So, um, but I think that's all I have today. Couple questions for you, Clint. Um, I can report that yes, there are crowds on Echo. I've been there twice. You can add Rockport to that list. I've been there twice. I hit East Canyon last weekend in hopes of. Uh, hooking into either a wiper or a kokanee and failed miserably. Um, can you remind us when the kokanee were introduced into East Canyon, Rockport, and Lost Creek? So Lost Creek and Rockport received fish this last year, so they'd be ra relatively small. Um, East Canyon may have had them for two years. We had... Um, in the tournament this last week, and this is just from word of mouth, I understand that there was 11 inch uh, kokanee that was caught in East Canyon, but we've had them there for a number, like they've been there for a long time. We've just started augmenting and planting um, fry in East Canyon within just this last year. So um, if they're catching them, you know, there's not there's not huge numbers of them yet. I think once we get a spawn pulled off for two or three years, we'll see a, a definite change that way. Um, and with the zooplankton work that we're going to start, we'll probably use one of the three, whether it's Rockport Echo or um, East Canyon for our zooplankton toes. We'll do probably we're going to do. Um, Lost Creek and then state line and something either on Kazi or 
um, porcupine. They're kind of similar, those two. So, um, but state line had, I, in the two nets, I had a hundred and I think I had 139 kokanee in the two nets at state line this fall. Um, and that was after the spawn. So these were year and two, one plus and two plus year old fish. Um, so it was, it's pretty, it's pretty good, but they're not, they're not huge. They're, you know, the top was like 11 and a half inches. So, but. Could, you, could you give us a little more uh, of what you heard about the success of the ice fishing tournament at East Canyon? I know I, I happened to show up the day after, and maybe that was why the fish were skittish. I I would only imagine that that place is not going to be the same until maybe middle of next week. <laughs> um, I really didn't hear a whole lot other than the same. The same family, the same individuals that have won in the last seven years won it this year. Um, they've so all that's all I know. I don't know any other any other details. We talked very briefly about it yesterday, um, and Chris wanted Haramoto wanted to have um, a chat with one of our investigators because this is I think this is year either number seven or number eight that this individual has won this competition. Well, be that as it may, um, I wonder if all of the regions can uh, take advantage of state parks and their, I know at Rockport they were tracking uh, folks, checking um, your passes or collecting entry fees. So it seems like for these reservoirs that have state parks where the easy access is off the boat ramp, maybe the division can uh, of wildlife can work with state parks to get better feel for this increase in pressure. Uh, there's no question what I've seen is just dramatic increase in pressure. Yeah. And again, uh, we'll say more about this, but our steering committee, we're, we want to make sure the governor and the legislature is aware of the fact that there's a huge interest and tremendous increase in pressure on our state waters. But um, keeping track of these numbers, both in terms of ice fishing tournament sizes and visitation to state parks might be useful. Yeah, it's, I think that's one of the things will probably go out in a, a spring survey. I don't know if that's that's something that has been talked about, Randy, or not, but um, yeah, it's it's been nuts this year. It's been crazy. We've we even talked yesterday about some some changes, and my big concern was there's so many people on the water right now that anglers don't even have a chance to get on some of these waters um, unless they're there at five o'clock and some of these places won't open their gates till six. Um, so making changes or adding species to a body of water to encourage anglers to go there and fish when they're going to, you know, be all they get to do is from 630 on fight four foot waves coming off of wake boats is, you know, not very many people are going to do that. I know a lot of our guys don't even fish, you know, they don't touch Pine View from April till the end of October, just because of the, the sheer amount of people there. And most anglers aren't gonna wait in line for three and a half, four hours to, to get to a boat ramp and find out it's closed because there's too many people on the water. You know, there's not too many anglers that are gonna do that, but that is a common, that was common every weekend at Pine View, at Willard. Um, so it was crazy. So good point, Bert. I'd also venture to say that harvest is probably greater in the winter months. And I don't know if there's any data to back that up, but based on just the numbers of people out on the ice, on the hard water, no doubt the pressure's up and that may figure into stocking plans too. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, nobody could have foretold what was coming with COVID, but um, because of wanting Lost Creek to be Blue Ribbon, we'd already anticipated in, and started stocking a little bit heavier um, at Lost Creek. Uh, the creel surveys that we have, have been doing the last couple of years, you know, we, uh, Chris talked about one yesterday on Manaway and, you know, we, we have 40,000 bluegill taken out of Manaway and just in the winter time, you know, I mean, and, and so our age, and he even talked about our age structure, you know, coming here 10 years ago, uh, eight inch 
an eight inch bluegill could be five years, it could be 10 years old. Now you catch a seven inch fish, it's five years old and you don't catch anything that's, you know, over five years old. Like they're just, they're just gone. It takes them five years to get to that size. And at that point they're harvested. So it is, it is um, truly changing the way we, we work here in the region. And uh, it's hard. Our, our region has a lot of places that are all froze, but there's other regions that don't have ice. And, and so we're picking up, I think, some of those guys that just want to get out on the ice. They're coming this way or they're headed, you know, now strawberries froze and fish lakes froze. But some of these lower elevation places haven't been freezing. And so we're getting a lot of traffic, I think, this way, too, from, from places that people would normally go, like to Deer Creek and some of those places. Yep. Looks like we have Russ Lawrence, who's raised his hand. And then after that, Randy Opplinger. Go ahead, Russ. So, Bert, I was just going to give a give my two cents on East Canyon. Uh, East Canyon uh, has been a little fickle this this winter, um, and that's both from my experience and from uh, many others that I've talked to. Um, so, so don't feel bad if you didn't do so well there. Um, Echo obviously has been very um, steady as far as pressure, and uh, Echo's been offering quite a quite a few um, successful trips. Um, perch are small though. Um, but, but if you can land those trout, um, there's still, there's still some good ones to be had in there. Um, I've also fished, uh, Pineview. I took a friend up there, um, and we were catching a lot of crappie, um, landing a few perch and the perch were definitely bigger than Echo. Um, but he did land a, uh, tiger muskie as well. I don't know if you can see that, but, uh, it just happened to hook in a soft spot in that mouth and he was able to land that. So uh, pretty, pretty fun. I've never, never actually caught a muskie through the ice. So <laughs> also I was, was going to say at, at Echo, I, I actually landed a really nice uh, smallmouth bass as well. And, and, you know, those don't come through the ice very often, but uh, it was pretty exciting to get as well. I did go to Hiram and, uh, Hiram produced some really nice uh, perch, really nice perch. So just uh, anyway, been out, but uh, definitely not as good and successful as Natalie was out in the Northeast region. That's for sure. <laughs> We're not all paid to fish like she has been though. <laughs> oh, come on now. I haven't, I haven't got paid once. I mean, I've only been able to go ice fishing once. Oh. Of course I was, that was because I was shooting ducks instead of ice fishing. So I had to get well, my priorities. I, these are not all work trips. I will tell you that, unfortunately. I do work I'm, also. <laughs> well, we have our, we have a Pineview uh, certification on the second. Um, our health certification for Pineview for crappies and bluegills and perch is coming up on the 2nd of February. Um, and that will be probably our, our kind of paid trip to, to do some fishing. Um, the guys like Russ, the guys that I've seen that have been catching crappies, they catch a few perch, but they're not catching very many at uh, Pineview. Um, Sorno's done really well. Um, even, even today I got a picture of him holding up two bluegill at the same time, caught a double on bluegills at Manway. Um, and he's been hitting Hiram pretty faithfully. He's found some, some really nice perch there. Um, I didn't mention those two because they're not blue ribbon fisheries but he's getting out like it seems like three or four times a week making me jealous and, and envious um but we've been stuck home in quarantine for like a month now so i'm itching to get out and do some stuff so um all right let's see. randy had a question yeah. on randy and then rex uh, this isn't a question per se, but it, I'm kind of jumping back on the conversation we were having about pressure on our fisheries related to COVID. Uh, one thing we are doing, we did a survey last, I want to say June, something like that, looking at the effect of COVID on angler use, license sales, to see if really we're trying to target whether these people have purchased licenses last year, you know, as part of, you know, the purchasing because of COVID you know, if they're going to stay with the sport or not, you know, whether this is a temporary bump or not. So we're going to probably put that survey back out sometime this spring with the idea of regaging those same people and seeing if their uh, opinions of fishing have changed, if they're, 
you know, interest is maybe, you know, waning over time or not. So hopefully we'll have some more data. We'll, we'll share that. But yeah, it's something, you know, in the Salt Lake office, we're definitely interested. We see a license bump of maybe about 15% more sales this year than we saw the previous year, I guess in 2020 versus 2019. That's all because of COVID and seeing whether that's going to continue or not. And Rex. I, I just, I'm retired and I have to tell you, Clint, you and Natalie, that my sympathy meter didn't move for either one of you. So just for the record. Thanks, Rex. <laughs> I will say that um, my buddy hooked into a, a substantial rainbow on Echo on uh, one of our trips out there. I wish I had seen it above the ice. I saw it through the hole. Um, and the gill plate was about as big as a cupped hand. It was easily over 20. I don't know how much over 20, but that was pretty cool. And we've landed several nice trout, um, Echo and Rockport as well. But man, East Canyon, nada. So those those big rainbows are, I think, part of that magnum stocking program that we've started in in a couple of those fisheries. So they're going in at like an average of like 12 to 14 inches, something like that. Um, and like you're saying, Bert, you know, everybody that's going to Echo is chasing those big rainbows. Um, and that's that's going to be part of, I think, what we're going to start looking at zooplankton wise is if we can you know, do that, we would like to grow some of those fish out and see, and we may at some point in time, look at a, a trophy component there um, in one of those three, whether it's East Canyon, Echo or Rockport, um, just for, for some size of some big rainbows for the guys that want to chase something like that. But we're going to hold on to stocking those, those magnums because we've had a really good return on ang from anglers and, and it seems to be very, very popular. Um, and so we're using some of our pounds of fish that we get, it sounds like, to, to put towards those, those big rainbows and, and have bigger ones stocked for the anglers to, to get into. I could also see an outreach program with uh, focusing on techniques for some of these more um, unusual species like kokanee and like wiper. Um, and it looks like Natalie has her hand up. Natalie, you have a question? I just wanted to wrap around, back around to what Clint had talked about with some of our panfish populations, forage fish populations, and the pressure that we're experiencing. Um, Chris Penny and I have talked about this a couple times now that we may be at one of these crossroads in uh, fisheries management where there's so much pressure from the top and we've got predators coming from the bottom. Um, it may be that time in life where we have to start thinking more about actual panfish management and regulation changes. We are doing that in our region. Um, the one area that I wanted to bring up real quick is big sand wash. Um, as many of you guys know, we've experienced extreme pressure through the ice for the last several years there. I think that this year we're starting to finally see those effects. Um, people cannot go there and do what they did two years ago. You really have to work to find a perch now. Um, we have a walleye population that's coming up from the bottom end eating lots of young year perch. We are catching walleye through the ice consistently there this year. They're all about 12 to 14 inches. But um, I really do think we're about to that crossroads, at least in some of our areas where we manage for panfish and a forage base to try to maintain our predators, that we are gonna have to start looking down some different paths to our future. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday too. So, yeah. Uh, I thought I saw that Nick had his hand up, but I may be misreading that. Nick, did you have a question or comment? I don't know. Okay. All right, any further questions for uh, Clint or Russ regarding the Northern region? Any comments? Um, the northern region does not have any candidate waters listed to, to be visited and evaluated this year. Um, we'll be talking about possible reevaluation schedule later this afternoon. Um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and for our regional biologists, if there are waters where you feel like 
the council should go see either improvements or consider if there's degradation uh, as a result of fire or something of that sort. Um, let us know because uh, we'll be looking for places to go in summertime. Any further questions for Clint or Russ? All right, hearing none, let's move on. It's now uh, 1110. Uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. Next on the list is the Southeast region. And both Cal and Jordan are with us today. Not sure who's going to be presenting, but I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, Jordan, you want me to start off? Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, we have, really haven't been doing much this year or uh, this uh, first this year. Just working on our uh, report from last uh, field season and working on data, um, putting on putting together some uh, proposals for for you guys to review this uh, upcoming uh, spring. Um, Schofield's um, been fishing quite well. Uh, we've had a lot of people up there. Um, I know one of our officers was up there middle of the week last, I think a week or two ago, and there was over 200 people fishing in the middle of the week on Schofield, which was really neat to see. Um, so yeah, we're seeing the increased pressure um, in our region also. The, I guess the most biggest activity we've had this uh, for our region is just this week, uh, we were down on Recapture Reservoir uh, collecting Northern Pike for disease certification. Um, we're gonna be using um, Pike out of Recapture as part of our bridge source for tiger muskie propagation in the state. And so we've been trying to collect enough fish so we can spawn pike this spring. So um, had quite a few guys down there on uh, Tuesday, but of course we had to have a snowstorm come through and that low pressure really took the bite off and um, it was kind of tough fishing, but we did pull a few through the ice and we'll probably have to go back down here in a couple of weeks and try it again. But, uh, um, but we've been uh, doing a lot of work down there. One of our uh, WRI or uh, Habitat Council proposals, and it might be presented to the Blue Ribbon Council, is a boat dock um, proposal for recapture. Uh, I'll be I'm working with the BLM and Blinding City on recreation improvements around recapture, and uh, that project is going to be a multi-year phased project where uh, we may be looking at a whole new boat dock, uh, boat ramp parking areas, campgrounds, and really uh, improve the area for angler access. So um, hopefully you guys will get the chance to review that proposal this year. Um, our other big proposal in the region is angler access improvements with the Forest Service on the Manti Forest. Uh, this is the North Zone. So uh, we'll be working in the Farron drainage um, above Joe's Valley, um, some work over in San Pete County, and then also up above by Electric Lake. Um, the forest is redoing and maintaining all the fishing trails around uh, several uh, reservoirs. And uh, I have a proposal uh, tag teaming with them to add um, a fishing pier on one of our reservoirs up there for ADA access and also fixing a couple bridges and walkways. Um, so they are uh, more accessible for anglers, so. And then we also have a phase two of our Huntington Creek project. Um, this is a combined, or this project has been combined with a larger project with the Forest Service. Um, it'll be the Manti Healthy Forest um, project. And between um, everything, um, we're looking at 1.2, $1.3 million worth of work on the uh, Huntington Creek and the Manti Forest with the um, both agencies and Trout Unlimited working together. So um, really cool project um, coming up. So, but really other than that, um, I don't have much other, anything else to add unless Jordan has something. Yeah, I've got a couple of things. Um, I've been consistently monitoring the flows in Lower Fish Creek below, um, below Schofield. Uh, just to kind of recap, um, I have a three CF three and a half CFS lease that we orchestrated between the Division of Wildlife and Carbon Canal Company. Uh, Division of Wildlife actually holds that lease. 
Right now, we don't have the, the ability to deliver the entire flow without cavitating the gate on the dam, which we would be held liable for the maintenance on that. We don't have the money for that. So uh, we take what we can get. I measured it yesterday. It's uh, at about 2.4 CFS, uh, which is better than nothing. They exercise the gate regularly, open it up to the minimum flow and close and bring it back down to make sure that it's clear and that that's just mostly leaking water from from existing cavitation damage um, i've got a an engineering report that we've completed and is being reviewed by the bor to actually add a new low flow gate that will um, flush water through the air vent on the dam during the winter uh, so we can deliver that full water right and um, without causing any damage. Uh, the local water users are liking that proposal because it will give them the ability to release water from, from zero all the way to having gates fully opened. Whereas right now they can, the minimum that they can release is about 13 CFS um, before they start causing damage to their gates. Um, on, on the other hand, we're trying to increase those winter in-stream flows by working with the, the other major canal company in price. They have a, a winter stock water right that they would like to lease to us because they don't use it very much anymore and they only exercise it every few years to, to prove up on the water right. And we would be looking at uh, a similar scenario where we'd lease the water, move the point of diversion to right below Schofield Dam. Uh, so we can release uh, more winter water and keep that fish population healthy through the winter um, instead of them closing the dam. Um, so uh, looking positive, that program is really growing and, uh, you know, keeping the habitat good in lower fish creek through the winter. Just to be clear, where are you measuring these flows that you reported, the 2.4 CFS? Uh, me measuring of the old weir that's uh, just like 200 yards below the dam. Yep. Okay. I know it. So, um, and so the funding for this low flow gate, how would that be? How's that envisioned? Um, I already have the funding to put it in if it gets approved. Um, I've worked with uh, corporate interests on this water lease that have given me enough money to pay for the lease as well as uh, take care of any. Uh, infrastructure needs that we need to do. So we really probably wouldn't be coming to Blue Ribbon unless it it ends up co going over about fifty thousand dollars. But right now the it's projected to cost about forty thousand, which would give us plenty of leeway. Great. So, um, the second project that y'all should be interested in is uh, Mud Creek, uh, one of the tributaries to Schofield. Um, what, 10 years ago, Calvin, they did a big restoration project on Mud Creek. Looks really awesome. It actually fishes pretty well for cutthroat once you can get in there and fish it for cutthroat. Uh, the landowner right below that is allowing us to uh, do more restoration. It's about a mile of stream. And uh, I'm finishing up the, the final touches with Division of Water Resources, excuse me, Division of Water Quality. Um, for an EPA 319 grant that'll give us $400,000. Um, that will, that, that's not going to be enough to do the whole project, I don't think. So we'll, we'll get the project engineered and plans laid out and then begin applying through WRI Habitat Council and Blue Ribbon to, to complete the funding package to get that done. So the plan is 2021, go through engineering, 2022, begin, um, begin construction and just to be clear on the mud creek project we're talking about above town up yep. up in the town yeah um, uh, just that property that's immediately above town all, all yeah. the way up to where the previous restoration was done um that should help schofield reservoir because we get a lot of uh, total phosphorus input into schofield from mud creek um, that total phosphorus contributes to uh, toxic algae blooms in the summer when it when the water gets low and gets hot. Jordan, would we uh, have access to the land where we were going to do the restoration with this private landowner, or, or do we have something in place? I'm sorry that I don't know. 
Uh, we there's already a walk-in access agreement with that landowner, so you can already access it. But it's also uh, the Carbon Water Conservancy District purchased a, an easement along the the creek so that they could fence it off and begin to do restoration work. So it's public property and accessible anyway. So, and that would essentially extend the 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 part that was rehabilitated or uh, at where work has been done in the past. That's correct. It, it adjoins it. It's just downstream from that area. Right. If you haven't been, I I stumbled upon this Mud Creek access point uh, just by virtue of driving through from um, Electric Lake to Schofield, taking that road. And uh, it was quite stunning. I guess uh, at least one bridge being put in for stock so that they don't have to wade through the water. Uh, it looks like a pretty little stream. There are fish in it. Um, and of course, that would most likely be what I guess Colorado cuts uh, coming up from Schofield itself. I, I'd love for it to be Colorado cuts, but they are actually Bear Lake fish that they yeah, stock in Schofield. So, oh, okay. My it bad. Should be, it should be, it is historic uh, um, range for Colorado River cutthroat. We surveyed that section of uh, Mud Creek two years ago, and uh, a lot of cutthroat. We had a couple tiger trout from Schofield come up, but we also had a grayling in Mud Creek because um, we had stocked grayling in Lower Gooseberry Reservoir, and they've come down all through that system through Schofield and up Mud Creek. So you, you never know what you might catch in there. Um. I have a further question for the southeastern region, and I, I'm not sure whether I know Jordan, you and Cal meet and talk occasionally. I just wanted to make sure Cal got appropriate feedback from our November meeting where we discussed um, landing number four and also recapture. I, I brought that up. I camped on recapture. So Cal, I, I, I wonder if you have any questions or concerns or if you've gotten um, kind of a, a, a report from Jordan regarding the scoring process since you weren't able to make that meeting. Yeah, Jordan has uh, given me some information and stuff like that. And, um, and um, I really don't have much questions. Um, Landing City right now, with uh, their enthusiasm with recapture, um, we're we're putting in a lot of effort now for the next three five years to do work on recapture reservoir for, you know, for for all types of access improvements, and also we're talking habitat structure for panfish and everything in there also. Um, and after that, they'd like to expand to their other waters nearby, and so um, blanding three and blanding four. If there's any other improvements that we could. Um, can do there and then we're looking at some stuff on the forest uh above town too so um i, I you know got some feedback and, and that will help you know with the future here with planning and working with the with the the city down there for um improving our the reservoirs so one of the ideas that was floated specific for blending number four is Instead of Blue Ribbon, uh, what benefits would come from designating it a community fishery? Um, are there ways to leverage a community fishery, perhaps even for blending number three as well as blending number four, um, and make that uh, sort of fall in, uh, in line with the hopes and wishes of the Blending City Council? Any thoughts on community fishery designation? You know, for us, um, a designation, we could probably look at that, but do we have different um, special regulations for harvest on bass and stuff like that and trout? Right now, we can use harvest um, or have harvest in the reservoir and not have to worry about um, you know, protecting the bass or the um, tiger trout in there. Um, and the rainbows, they do get harvested out pretty quickly, but uh, the ones that stay in there are pretty fat and, and are healthy. So um, it'd be more just kind of an outreach and more of a way to work with the city to you know, maybe call it a community fishery, but maybe not really change much management for us. So, I mean, that's something we could, you know, look into. 
I'm sort of reminded of Gigliotti Pond in Helper, but a very different situation, obviously, being uh, basically an impoundment on the Price River. Um, I, I guess the other part of this is I'm fascinated to hear more about um, plans for recapture. So my personal experience, I camped three nights on recapture. I camped on the northeast side. Um, kind of away from people, managed to find a place that actually had a picnic table. Um, <clears throat> but um, a lot of dispersed camping, putting a lot of pressures uh, on the local surrounding area, both in terms of garbage and uh, you know, everything else you might expect that comes along with dispersed camping. Um, moreover, given that the ramp is really just the old roadbed and on the northeast side, that's deteriorating pretty badly. Uh, but, you know, I'd be camped, I camped back a ways away from, from the reservoir and folks would roll in towards dusk with their RVs and such. And um, it wasn't an, an issue. It just seems so completely unregulated and uh, I was there when a fire restriction was in place, and I looked across at the the southwest shore and saw four or five uh, campfires during a closed se season. Uh, there was also a really strange explosion one morning um, with a large uh, cloud of smoke coming from it and four trucks driving away pretty quickly, but I didn't know what that was about. <laughs> but the bottom line is I had more fun fishing recapture because uh, seeing uh, those pike, even if they are small hammer handles, seeing them take your lure and, and just, you know, it, it was pretty fun fishing um, as yeah. opposed to blending four where essentially I trolled and picked up a half a dozen rainbows, but I couldn't get to the depths of, you know, the bigger tigers and, I guess Brian Anderson hooked into a nice bass pretty deep. But um, at any rate, I would love to see some effort put into recapture. Is there any, I, I gather that's all BLM and BOR land. Are there any visions for any sort of state park involvement or a more formal development? Yes. So right now, Blanding City has a uh, receipt of federal grant of $50,000 to hire um, an engineering firm to design plans for recapture. Um, and so with the Blanding City, us uh, with the division and the BLM, uh, we'll be sitting down this year discussing um, the development of a new boat ramp, parking areas, uh, potentially restrooms on the west side. Um, they would um, do designated camping areas. Um, they're talked about an ATV and a foot trail around the reservoir, um, a hand launch area, um, swimmers beach. Um, so th there's the options are are numerous right now. And so they, um, with part of our project, their in kind contribution for the boat dock is to develop the plans, a master recreation plan for recapture. Uh, the BLM is involved and they are working with Blinding City to allow the city management of the shoreline and the facilities so they can take uh, control of the restrooms, the, the garbage, the boat dock, stuff like that. And the Blinding City has said they will be glad to take on the um, maintenance and operation of all of uh, that, infra, um, that structure and all that infrastructure. So, um, so yes, there's a lot of uh, potential um, um, large infrastructure putting in uh, to go in there. So um, everybody's excited about that. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're looking at, you know, completely, you know, changing or improving the access with uh, major parking areas, campgrounds and stuff like that. And so it would all be managed and maintained with, from Blinding City. Um, they've even discussed a, um, a trail from town because it's about a mile and a quarter from edge of town um, and making a lane for bike path or something so kids or f f people can just walk from town down to the reservoir too versus uh, walking the highway or something like that. 
I got disconnected. I missed part of that response, but I'm encouraged by what I did hear. Um, I would add that, you know, except for Yuba, I'm not sure there are very many waters in the state where you can intentionally go and catch pike. Um, and it's fun. Um, I met a, a young fellow who's a volunteer firefighter down there who's from Wisconsin. And he doesn't care that they're small because <laughs> in following family tradition, he was going to pickle his pike. And yeah. so <laughs> he was, uh, he's a regular angler down there, kayak angler. So yeah. it's kind yeah, of fun. We've, we've seen pike. So we uh, netted it in November um, and then fishing it this week. We've, we've had several pike that are in the 30 to 32, 34 inch range. So there are some larger ones. I did see a 15, 18 pounder come out this spring. Um, a friend of mine had caught down there. So uh, there are larger pike, but for the most part, yeah, you can catch, um, you know, 12 to 25 inch pike um, on a good day, you know, several an hour um, all day long. Yeah, I didn't do that well, but I managed a few and they were more like 14, 16, maybe the biggest was 18, but um, great. Glad to hear that, um, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, we are putting together a video um, with the division Facebook page for Monday to, to discuss um, our work at the capture this past couple months, um, because we will be collecting eggs and using them as a, a potential new brood source for um, pike for our tiger muskie uh, propagation. Um, so they, our outreach folks wanted to kind of highlight that. So you'll see something probably first of next week about our efforts down there. Good. Um, I guess the only other thing I'd say about blending number four is I'm not sure the city of blending wants more people to visit, given that that's the city water supply. <laughs> so they're they're fine with more visitors, but they were worried about large boats that could potentially be going from Lake Powell through and stopping, even if they had been decontaminated or if they hadn't, you know having that, that higher risk for AIS going into their water system. They just, that, that was where their, um, their concern was at. Okay, thanks. So um, Southeastern region has not identified any waters to be visited um, and scored for 2021. But of course, Schofield is one that we're watching and that Cal and his crew have been working hard to restore. And I wondered if there were any comments you had specifically about uh, your view on Schofield, when it may be ready for review for a visitation and evaluation, and then any other waters in your region that you might be either uh, uh, interested in putting on the list, the candidate list in the future, or where you think the council might need to go visit to make sure they're still blue ribbon. Okay. Um, so for Schofield, I mean, we're, we're excited to see, you know, what, what's been coming out and how the fishing has been a lot this past year, um, where we've been receiving a lot of great feedback from anglers with the, the catches of cutthroat and um, rainbows. And this past year, or the past two years, we started stocking a larger tiger trout, and we're seeing those show up in our krill again and into our nets. So um, I did see a 10 pound tiger trout caught at, you know, mid December out of there also. So we're seeing um, good things, um, but part of our management plan um, and kind of in our internal discussions was once we hit all of our goals, achieved all everything that was outlined in our management plan with uh, catch rates um, of individual species in our gill nets and catch rates of anglers or fish by our anglers, um, is when we feel it, it was time to say we've hit the reservoir's potential, you know, full potential. And then that's when we figured it would be a full blown, yes, this is definitely a blue room fishery. So um, it's fishing great. Um, it's been fun. Uh, summertime, you just never know what you might catch. We've had anglers catching, uh, or excuse me, musky, wiper, um, cutthroat tigers rainbows um, we had like what one walleye in our gill nets this last year too that we stocked in there so um everything seems to be producing well and our chub numbers continue to decrease um in the reservoir so 
that's kind of what our reasoning was with Schofield was, yeah, it's been performing well, but we just haven't achieved the goals that we've outlined in our management plan. And when we hit that, that's when we're like, yeah, thumbs up, let's go. Um, as far as other waters, um, I'm trying to think if I'm off the top of my hand, really not much change or anything I think to evaluate. Um, one thing I would say is um, we are working with Emory County uh, Tourism, uh, the department this year, and they will be hosting a tagged fishing contest in Mill Site, Huntington North, and Joe's Valley Reservoirs. Um, and they're probably going to run that from about Memorial Day to Labor Day is kind of the time frame that summer month. So um, if, if you're down here, um, we're working with them to do this tag contest and uh, increase um, usage at some of the, the Emory Water, Emory County waters down here. So that might be something if you're in the area. Um, we've introduced or restocked um, catfish, channel catfish in Huntington North last year. These were 10, 12 inch catchable catfish and guys were catching 22 inch fish by the end of the this season so we were seeing some really nice um, catfish coming out um, we've seen multiple 10 pound wipers come out of Huntington North this year too um, it's just that was tough just because of the summer crowds with the power boats and and um, you just really can't fish it when you've got 20 other boats out there and they're all throwing the waves out uh, at you and you can't really troll or sit there and jig anything so uh, the shoulder season for honey to north is the way to go for for uh, for fish in that. So that's probably all I, I can add right now. And is there ice fishing at Huntington North? Yeah, it's froze over right now. Um, guys are catching some 16 to 18 inch rainbows through the ice. Um, ice off last year, um, we saw multiple four to six pound rainbows being caught right at ice off. And so... Um, I've, I haven't had any luck through the ice when I've fished it, but uh, um, I've got some new ideas and just haven't made it out there yet this year. So um, last I heard, it was about eight inches of ice, so it's plenty thick. Um, and uh, um, I know a few guys have gone down and tried to pill wipers through uh, the ice, but now Natalie had told us the secret, so maybe maybe I need to go tomorrow. Sounds like a plan. Um, Electric Lake was on our uh, list a few years back, and one of the concerns there was Pacific Ore not really wanting to see huge increases in visitorship. But uh, sounds like it. Electric Lake is one of the water bodies. <clears throat> you mentioned this collaborative plan with Forest Service to increase access. Can you tell us more about what, if anything, is planned for Electric? So uh, it's actually a little reservoir. It's Bench's Pond next to uh, Electric Lake. Um, we we are planning to sit down and discuss uh, more future plans of uh, uh, Electric Lake. I had uh, was hoping to do that this last year, but because of COVID, we never really can meet. Um, so we're it's still kind of the same. The one thing that's changed with Electric is the mine. Um, is now beginning to discharge some water out of uh, the uh, one of their tunnels into Upper Huntington Creek right above the reservoir. And so um, I believe that pipeline is gonna be bringing in 20 CFS of water year round now into Electric Lake, uh, right at uh, um, kind of the high water mark um, there on the Upper Huntington Creek. So. Um, we're going to see an increase of flow um, into the channel right there. And so that's something we're, we're keeping an eye on. That'll help the kokanee. And what about flows below electric in Huntington Creek itself? Um, the Pacific Core is usually keeps it um, the winter base. I think it's around 30 or 50 CFS. Um, and so we've always had, always had good water going downstream. Um, they, um, I think there is a, they have to provide so much for the power plant and that's i think the, the minimum flow so they have to continue to let water out of uh, electric so no issues i don't think we'll see any real increase in um you know summer flows or anything like that because of the I increase in in the tributaries coming in i think we just might see a little more water in the reservoir itself so all right, thank you, Cal and Jordan. Are there any further questions for Cal or Jordan on the Southeast region? 
All right, hearing none, let's move on. It's now 1140. I've got about 20 minutes left, but let's move to the Southern region. Nick and Dave. So I think I'll go ahead and do the update for the Southern region. Uh, most of it will be focused on Fish Lake, so I'll start with it. Um, I mentioned last time that we were going to change the way we're doing the perch tournament. COVID. Um, so it actually started uh, January 1st, and then it'll, it'll run through the Labor Day weekend. And so people can go out and catch tag fish. We're just not doing a single day event this year. Um, and then there'll be drawings held on April 1st and then Labor Day weekend to give out prizes. Um, there's no registration this year, so it's really just meant to be spread out over a longer period of time. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was I, I mentioned last meeting that we we put in a project and we've got $5,000 from you guys to help with snow removal for the perch tournament this year. Um, but because we're not doing that single day event, it, we were going to use the money to help with snow removal um, just whenever we needed it. And the idea was we would hire our heavy equipment crew to come up um, and move snow for us. Um, but since I talked to you last time, actually right after that meeting, uh, we had a meeting with um, the Forest Service and some other people to talk about a lot of stuff, especially uh, the new marinas and parking areas and, and the best way to manage everything. And we realized that um, the Forest Service actually had um, had the truck needed and the personnel needed to do snow removal throughout the winter. But what they were lacking was an actual snow plow. Um, and so we talked to uh, Bert a little bit and Randy, um, and it just made a whole lot of sense that instead of using that $5,000 to hire our heavy equipment crew, um, where it takes, it's kind of expensive to mobilize them, and then we only have a, you know, a short period where they're there working, and then that's kind of it. We've spent the money. It made more sense if we helped the Forest Service buy the snow plow, and then they can help with snow removal throughout the winter. And then they've got that snow plow for future years too. So it just seemed kind of like a no brainer. So hopefully everyone's all right with us using that money. They've got the plow um, and it should be, they should be using it this week or next week. Looks like we might get some snow this weekend. So hopefully it'll be running then. But um, yeah, what they've got is basically a couple of guys who do a lot of work with uh, main, maintaining trails and campgrounds and that sort of stuff. So during the winter, they're kind of looking for stuff for them to do. So I think this will really work out well. Um, next update on Fish Lake is they finished Lakeside Marina. So last time they were kind of in the middle of, last time I updated you, they're kind of in the middle of the Lakeside Marina upgrades and they finished that. And it's basically increased the marina capacity uh, threefold. So it, it's going to be really nice. Um, and there's a nice big parking area there now. So Lakeside's done, the Lodge Marina is done. So those are the first two marinas you come to. Um, next will be the Bowery Haven Marina. That's the third one. And so Stan's got a project in uh, to work on that. Um, the, the fish cleaning station, we've actually got money. I talked to Stan, that fish cleaning station at Bowery Haven is going to go in this spring. So that'll go in. Um, but yeah, we're coming into the kind of the last big year for the marina renovations and everything's looking pretty good. Um, the fishing pier, we were kind of on the fence last time I talked to you about exactly what we were going to do with that. Um, and basically Stan didn't feel like he was in a position to really start pushing for money to actually build the marina this coming fiscal year. So we're going to wait a year. He's got a small project in the uh, kind of finish up and um, put the finishing touches on the engineering and really make sure we've got that button down. Um, and then also some of the um, kind of private donations that we were counting on, they got a little, a little more uncertain, especially with all the COVID stuff going on. So hopefully this extra year gives, gives us a chance to figure that out better. So that's where the pier's at. Um, I think that's everything I had on Fish Lake. Um, there any questions about Fish Lake? Yeah. 
Um, I, that new marina at Lakeside looks really nice. I was there last Friday. You know, my only complaint is no snow. I got out of the truck and got an eye full of dirt from the parking lot. I mean, there was no snow. It was amazing. But uh, you could have walked down to the outhouse there down on the south end. I, I don't, you'd have got snow on the bottom of your feet, but the fishing was good. The bite was really light, but good fishing. No perch. We caught a perch. Oh, really? Yeah. And we fished from 14 to 60 feet of water. Hmm. Up, up yeah, by we... back and up point. Okay. Yeah, we've we've had so far the reports we've got is it's been pretty decent fishing. Um, I, I I have talked to people who've gotten into the perch. I mean, they're they're definitely still in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, the the snow is bad. I pretty much all over our region we're about forty percent of normal for snowpack. So we we need some good storms or it's going to be pretty ugly this next year. Um, so moving on from Fish Lake, um, so one thing I wanted to bring to your guys' attention is uh, Clear Creek, uh, which is a blue ribbon water. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with Clear Creek or maybe newer members, it, it, it was blue ribbon uh, for quite a few years. And then in, I think it was 2010, there was a, um, a big fire and then some flooding basically wiped out the fish population so we moved it from blue ribbon to potential onto the potential list and as part of that fire and, and flooding that basically killed all the fish we use that as an opportunity to reintroduce cutthroat and native fish throughout the whole drainage so that took a few years but once we got um once we got the fishery back to to being a good sport fishery and we had the cutthroat reestablished throughout and Blue Ribbon funded a lot of the work um, to get the habitat back where it needed to be. I think it was 2018 that we had everybody, you know, we had a, a meeting there and, and had members fish it and re-rank it. And so I think it was 2018 that it got back on the Blue Ribbon list. And so it's been back on Blue Ribbon the last few years. Um, but I want to give you guys an update that we've found um, some rainbow trout and, and hybrids in one of the tributaries. And so that's probably going to require a rote known treatment to deal with with those fish. But as of right now, that treatment will just be um, most likely just on one of the tributaries. So it's not the main stem clear creek that's running through the Fremont Indian State Park. Uh, so as of right now, I don't think it, it's a reason to, it would be a reason to move it back down to potential, especially not this summer because we're not going to treat it until the fall if we do. So this, this year, it should be good fishing. I'll just need to revisit with you guys later in the year um, and see how you're feeling about it and see exactly what we're gonna need to do for a treatment. But I wanted to put that on your radar so it doesn't come as a shock if I tell you later on that we may need to do some rote known treatments there. Um, the other thing with that is letting everybody know because sometimes rumors can get going and if, if you hear anybody talking about a treatment there, that's what's going on. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't get out that we're treating Clear Creek and it's not going to be any good fishing because that, that's not true. It'll be good this year. Um, the last thing is just we've got some angler surveys going. So we've got the angler survey at Quail Creek Reservoir that we started in October that I think I told you about. And the plan was to start one at Gunlock last April. We suspended that because of COVID. Uh, but we're feeling pretty good that things have returned enough to normal um, and we've got some money that we want to spend that's designated for a creel survey at, at gunlock so we're going to start that in march and that'll probably run through at least september so so we'll have those two creel surveys and the idea with those again is to kind of collect some baseline data about how the fisheries are doing and how anglers are interacting with them when we go into creating a management plan for all three of those Washington County reservoirs here in the next couple of years. So those were all the, the things I had on my notes to talk to you guys about, but I can answer any other questions you might have. Just curious if you've gotten any reports from Colob, any people ice fishing it, any feedback on uh, being relisted? Uh, not on Colob, it's not, it doesn't get much ice fishing pressure. Uh, they don't maintain the county road there, so you've got a snowmobile in. So it, it just doesn't get a whole lot of um, 
ice fishing pressure. I'm sure you could right now. Pretty much everything here is iced over. The people ice fish and doing pretty good, but it, it just doesn't get a whole lot of ice fishing pressure. And then have you seen substantial increases in pressure as best you can tell as a result of COVID in the Southern region? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially our state parks were just crazy for a few months. Um, yeah, it, it, it's been really busy. Um, one weird caveat was the, the Boulder Mountains. I spent a lot of time there doing sampling and it seemed a little quieter than normal. And I, and I finally realized it was Boy Scout groups. We, we didn't have, usually you have lots and lots of Boy Scout groups all over that mountain during the summer. And we didn't have that this year. That's the only exception. Everything else, it's been a much, much busier. And that's why we canceled the or suspended the gun lock survey because we, we didn't want to capture that. It, it wouldn't really help us trying to identify what changes the management plan had on on the fisher on how fishermen were using the lakes and do you think you could work with state parks to get a to quantify this increase in visitation and pressure for angling uh it's going to be hard i mean we can the problem a lot of our state parks the fishing is a kind of a it's not the main driver i mean especially like sand hollow um, gun lock, you get so many people, recreational boating, um, hanging out on the beach, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, it's definitely something worth talking to them about, but I think for a few months there when it was the busiest, I mean, they were just trying to keep their heads above water. I, I doubt there was a whole lot in terms of data collection or being able to tell how many of those people coming in were fishermen and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, all right. Well, and then uh, Southern Region has no candidate waters to evaluate in 2021 either. Were there any waters on the horizon that you think might uh, merit a visit from Council? Uh, not in the immediate, the immediate future. Um, Navajo is going to be one that if we can get it functioning well, um, it might be worth looking at it has the potential to have a great splake fishery and then it's so important to the local economies that it, and it, it's a beautiful water the forest service has good facilities there so it's one that could make sense down the road but we're we're not there yet um the other thing maybe to mention is we're hopefully in the next year or two we're going to try and do a big uh stream management plans like we've done the management plan like for boulder mountain where we get a group of anglers together and, and come up with a detailed management plan for the mountain we're going to try and do one for the streams in the southern region and so i could see something coming out of that um, that may change what we want to be blue ribbon streams in the region but that, that's at least a couple years away i would guess that's an interesting uh an uh, interesting idea to consider your streams sort of more holistically and collectively. So, all right, any further questions for Nick or Dave? Did you have anything you wanted to add? No, maybe Nick just wondered about Blind Lake. Uh, anybody been up there? Richard comes to mind. And yeah, Richard will usually sneak up there, but I, I haven't heard of anyone going into Blind. So no word on Pear Lake at all? No, I. Um, so I've been in contact with uh, Craig Ogden, who was on the, the management plan committee. Um, and he's actually a, a engineer for UDOT and works on their solar powered signs. And so he's gonna come up with a, um, a way that we can try and get that. The, the problem at Pear Lake is the aerator shuts off during the winter. We just can't get it to run 24 seven. Uh, but anyway, Craig, uh, he thought there was a way we could set that up, kind of rewire it and adjust things and get it to run 24 seven consistently. So I don't know if exactly what it's gonna look like, maybe adding some batteries or something, but we were hoping to get it in before this winter. That hasn't happened, but hopefully by the next winter. So, because once, once we do that, everywhere else where we've had a narrator run 24 seven, we haven't lost the fishery. So hopefully we can get that figured out. That'd be awesome, Nick. Uh, also, I'd be, I'd be willing to go up. You know, it sounds like ISOF is the critical.
critical time, I'd be willing to go up and reset or do whatever's needed if if you need volunteers. Well, yeah, and that's actually that's what we were talking about. Is what we're gonna try and do is I th I think we're okay through the winter. At some point, you know, it looks like later winter. I think with the shorter days, we just the batteries get run down and it shuts off and then it doesn't restart. Yeah, if we could get somebody in there maybe in March or something to turn it back on um, before ice off, I, I think we might be able to save it. All right. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Dave. Um, and if there are no further questions, it's now 1154. I don't want to push Central Region off any longer. I think... Um, if needs, if they need more than five minutes, though, we can certainly spill over. Although we have outreach, Crystal Ross coming to talk to us at one. But let's go ahead and proceed to Central Region, and Jackie and Ken are both on, so not sure who wants to take it, but take it away. I could find the unmute. I'll go ahead and and give an update and then if Ken has other things he wants to add, we can do that. Um, I don't have a lot to update. Um, we went through our work planning process yesterday as the central region. So we're finalizing our to-do list for the upcoming year and Slater and I are gonna work on a, a calendar of events so we can keep you guys posted on the sampling we're gonna do this year. Um, the thing that we have coming up first is we are going to do the Northern Pike collection at Yuba um, to help with the tiger muskie program. We'll do lakeside spawning at Yuba Reservoir. So that'll be in March. We don't have dates yet, of course, because it's water temperature dependent, um, but we are going to start gearing up for that. I know that Chris Crockett said that um, due to COVID, we're going to try to keep it probably more internal um in terms of manpower than we have in the past um, but we shall see how that works out um so that's our first upcoming kind of field season type stuff things that i've been working on or that we've been working on um we have a year-long krill survey starting at strawberry reservoir it started january 1st um so we'll have some good angler data to update you with in about a year's time we're still conducting our Deer Creek Angler Survey. So we were able to get funding to finish that. So we started that survey January, 2020, and it ran through March and then got shut down with COVID. We picked it back up July 1st, 2020, and we've been running it through this whole time. And we got funding so that we can continue the Creel to June 30th, 2021. So we'll have a full year's data plus two and a half months that I can compare January last year to January this year and see if there's any differences there. Um, fishing at Deer Creek Re Reservoir is interesting. People are really happy. Some days are gangbuster and they're catching 12, 14 um, trout per day in the 14 to 16 inch range most, most often. Um, and then they turn around and go back to the exact same spot and use the exact same stuff the next day and it's shut down. It's typical fishing. Um, one of the questions that we're asking at Deer Creek Creel, which Bert, you've kind of mentioned this a couple times about COVID. I don't, I can't say that we've seen an increase in pressure specifically due to COVID, although I would say generally, yes, we've seen more people out and about. Um, but we are asking people if they're harvesting more because of COVID. And that came from one of the first angler interviews I did um, in March, uh, or no, excuse me, in July. Uh, I had a guy saying that he was harvesting everything he could catch and he was feeding his neighbors who were elderly. Um, so it made me wonder if people were going to start harvesting more. We were hearing more about people growing gardens and all that good stuff. Uh, but surprisingly, the answer has been no. They are fishing more, but they're not harvesting more. So that's, and of course, I'll have the full analysis um, after the creel is finished. 
We also did uh, our gill netting surveys and electrofishing surveys on Deer Creek Reservoir. Um, our outreach person, Mike Packer, put together a really nice uh, electrofishing video combining Deer Creek and Jordan L Reservoir. It featured the Blue Ribbon Fisheries logo. So um, we're getting the name out there and people are seeing what kind of work we do out there. And then um, I'm working on those data right now to come up with a electrofishing and gill netting report for Deer Creek. So those should be available for you in the next couple months. Also working on Jordan L the last round of curtain netting that we completed in 2020, which ultimately was to lead to a monitoring plan for Jordan L Reservoir. But what I'm learning from my curtain netting data is I have no idea how to sample that reservoir. There's nothing consistent um, that I'm seeing in those methodologies, but we'll come up with something. And then of course the electrofishing report for Jordan L Reservoir from 2020. So those are, um, things I'm also working on. I, there was one other thing, but I've lost it now. So we might come back to that. Um, and then our region in general is just still working a lot on the fire drainages, uh, Diamond Fork, Nebo, Thistle, Holman, Petitney, all all that area. We're doing a lot of restoration work um, and repatriation. Slater installed a um, nice barrier on Nebo Creek in the Forest Service boundaries um, to prevent brown trout coming up from thistle. And we stocked some Bonneville cutthroat trout higher up. We stocked those in 2019 and saw good over winter and actually several size classes. So we saw some, or multiple size classes. So we saw some recruitment there. Um, and But that's kind of the focus for both Slater and Crockett this year is the restoration work. And if I'm not mistaken, they're focusing a lot on Diamond Fork and Nebo Creek this year. So um, that'll keep us busy for several years, of course. Not remembering that other thing, so I will say that's all I've got. And Ken, if you'd like to add anything or if anybody has any questions. Jackie, this is Rex. I was wondering what you're seeing down at Utah Lake with the Northerns. Oh, that's a good question. And that is what I was going to recommend or the other <laughs> update I was going to give. Um, is ice fishing conditions. So Deer Creek is sketchy for ice, but it always seems like it is and crazy people always go out there and fish. There's people fishing on the Charleston arm and around the Island. I have a hard time wanting to go ice fishing when there's also boats launching on the same water, but that's what's happening at Deer Creek with mixed success. Um, Jordan now no ice really to speak of. And then Utah Lake, um, We've got good ice in a, in a lot of locations and we're seeing a lot of anglers out on Utah Lake. Um, most successful for bluegill, white bass, and a handful of yellow perch and channel catfish. Um, people, a good group of people specifically targeting channel catfish and having some, some success with that. But I would say your general angler is mostly seeing bluegill and white bass. Um, as far as Northern Pike on Utah Lake, our natives crew, Dale and, and Keith, were able to tag um, with the acoustic radio telemetry tags. I can't remember the number. It was not a large number of fish. I want to say maybe seven last year. They're going to start their efforts again this year um, to finish putting out the rest of their tags and then start this telemetry study. The June Tucker Recovery Program has um, a request for proposal going out um, for that telemetry study. And there's not, I guess, Rex, not a lot of update or progress really other than this project does continue. I don't really have any reports specifically of people catching Northern Pike or seeing groups of them. 
yet, but we do anticipate that um, here in the next couple few weeks, I would say. All right. I uh, wanted to note that Mill Hollow was hit pretty hard by ice fishermen right at uh, Thanksgiving and was drivable uh, up till about Christmas time. I'm not sure if it can be, you can drive to it, but uh, saw a lot of pressure and I did pretty well there. Um, but central region, it's interesting, the lower elevations freeze first and thicker because of the inversion, I guess. Um, but um, any further questions for Jackie or Ken regarding central region? The last thing I'll say then is there are no central region waters to evaluate in 2021. Jackie, were there any further uh, waters that you think we might revisit or things that are further out on the horizon for evaluation? Um, my gut response is no, but I will say, well, we had Little Dell. We took Little Dell off. We're sitting on Little Dell. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. It was decided recently that we're going to proceed with the management plan that was written and start making some changes to the fishery there. Nothing drastic, I would say, but following along the agreed upon management plan. That being said, we don't have the willingness from, from Salt Lake that we would like to have from Salt Lake City that we would like to have as a partner on that water body. So I, I would love to say that everything goes great and eventually we can move that forward and, and look at it as a blue ribbon, but without that willing partner, I'm not, I'm not ready to say that. Um, we've talked about the Manti's Manti Lakes, the Manti Mountains, and and I keep pushing that down the future. And that's that's my fault. It just gets put on the back burner a lot. But I would love to take an inventory of what's going on in the Mantis, write a formal management plan, partner with Calvin in his region, and maybe present that whole area as a blue ribbon fishery. But I don't see that happening for several years because I've got a lot of work to do and I need to quit putting it on the back burner. But other than those, I can't think of anything. Okay, fair enough. Ken, did you have anything to add? I'm trying to get you unmuted, Ken. <laughs> You're muted, Ken. I noticed Ken's been hopping on and off, and I'm wondering if he's having connection issues. We might. Okay. All right. Well, okay. we, we... There, I, the, there he is. I finally got it unmuted. It, I kept clicking. It didn't want to unmute. But uh, anyway, I don't. I don't really have anything to to add. Uh, I haven't been able to do much this year or last year, so. Uh, I'm still working things, but uh, no, I don't have anything to add. All right. Well, thank you. Any further questions for Jackie or Ken, Central Region? All right. Hearing none, it's about seven minutes after noon. Um, we went a little bit long so we could get all the regional reports in in the morning. I want to point out that I purposefully rotate the order every month. So I'm sorry, Jackie, you ended up being at the very end there, but you were first in November, if I remember, and did my work correctly. Um, we are to meet back at 1 p.m. where we will have, we'll be joined by Crystal Ross from Outreach, and uh, we'll pick it up then. Gonna cut into our lunch a little bit, but um, Hopefully we'll see you all back here at 1 p.m. Thanks.
Hey, Randy. Yeah, Mike. I just want to give you a heads up. We had some tef technical issues um, right before the lunch break, and our YouTube stream stopped streaming. Um, we had some issues with some of our equipment. We had to reboot stuff. We're up and running again, but the, the YouTube link will be incomplete. It's missing part of the meeting. Okay. So I'm going to repost it after the fact. So we get the whole meeting again. Um, so it would be a different okay. YouTube link. Can you so make sure you send me that link? So we'll do. We'll do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. You bet.
17 season. Um, and then they were taken down. So there's that. But right now, you know, um, as the law is, you know, if he's posted it, it's it's private property and you can't walk through his property. So. And Calvin, this is Brian Anderson. Uh, question about that. You and I have communicated about trying to get a uh, public easement just because of historical ass access, which is allowed under state statutes and the division is reluctant to do that i understand and i guess my question is is the reluctance because of the railway right of way and sort of the complex situation there because anchors walking down a railway are i guess trespassing as well uh, or is it just sort of a philosophical position of the division that they don't want to invoke that right under state statute to try to uh, petition for access where, where there's been long-standing historical access? I, I, I think it's kind of both. And, and when um, these questions came to our region, you know, we, we provided input and then sent that, those questions off to our Salt Lake office. And so I know um, into our director's office and withdrew and uh, our attorney general's office, you know, um, person they they have made that decision and so randy might be able to find more out from up the salt lake way but uh, that type of um response we weren't sure how to you know to proceed so we kind of punted it up to salt lake and let them um, mill out around and that's the decision that they came up with i could try to dig a little more and get the the what our decision was i guess i mean i i wasn't involved in that so i don't have all the details yeah, uh, Calvin, what would happen? I mean, there there is a, a CWMU board, uh, and you can file complaints with that board over that CWMU. Would that do any good if if fishermen uh, protested or or wrote a, a letter in about the CWMU and not allowing them to fish the river? Yeah, I, I think it could help. Um, originally, the boundary for the CWMU went to the water's edge, and it was just recently that uh, they decided to start posting the actual corner of the property. And so if there was some pushback um, from uh, the, to the CWMU board that, you know, there were access through there for anglers prior, now not. You know that might uh, help out to change the boundaries back again. Um, I, I I'm not, you know, uh, been around that board or anything like that. But um, but that's kind of they can change boundaries, you know, every year. So um, that that would be an option, I think. Speaking of access concerns, are there any uh, rivers or streams that are currently blue ribbon where access has been restricted lately that folks are aware of? I mean, obviously I know uh, about our major waterways, but I was curious if there are any other uh, concerns, either, either um, streams and rivers or even access points to reservoirs and lakes. Bird, I got one. Um, so, and and it's not because of a lot. It, it's more because of changes in ownership than anything. But uh, we're starting to see where um, landowners are selling their property. We're losing walk-in access points, either because the kids who are now owning the property, or because the new owners want nothing to do with it or like in the situation of our Hennefer to Taggart um, tubing section of the Weber River um, we are not renewing that access because we don't get any use out of that because there's so many people there from May until the end of September now um, so many people are just floating up that it's and and it still kind of is now that it's been accepted by Morgan County, it is kind of a public access point so people can get in there. But um, I know that 
there has been, you know, there, and, and I'm going to be going through with Rachel and we're going to go through the renewals. I got 13 or 16 renewals. I don't remember how many, uh, for walk in access that as the fish guy, I have to do an evaluation on these properties for walk in access. And as the old walk in access guy, it's kind of handy too, I guess, but, um, but we're, we're losing some of those. Um, and it's not because of stream rulings or court rulings or anything like that. It's, you know, we're losing some that way. Um, I think we were able to hold on to the contract at Birch Creek Reservoir up by Randolph um, as that property sold, which is a good one. Um, but as far as other blue ribbon stuff, you know, we just we're losing some points on the Weber River and not in the places that we have the the ruling it's below echo reservoir that we're losing some of those and those kind of hurt so yeah that does hurt and also um i gather clint you have the issue it's not blue ribbon but um upper lost creek i don't know if there's been that has that sale gone through yeah the hell the sale has gone through i think uh Rachel is trying to talk to the owner. Um, he is a local representative here for, for us, um, or at least in that area. And so she's gonna try to work it out and see if it will work out, but um, I don't know, it's gonna be kind of tough. Uh, so yeah, that, one's, that one went through the first of the year. Um, so Ovards is now no longer in walk-in access. So it's, it's gonna be a little tough. Um, it, it's going to, it's going to make some changes. Uh, one of the big properties that I was working on years ago for access, and I still have been able to access it for work stuff is right, um, at mountain green at the mountain green exit there. Um, there was a big, uh, owner there and, and we would, we had no problem doing all of our cutthroat work and all that monitoring. And that's still probably going to be the case. But that individual sold his property to that Wasatch Peaks Ranch. And so that will all be private angling opportunities for those who have their 125,000 HOA fees a year to have their little house up on the hill. So um, it's going to be, it might be a little different there too. Because um, there was some access, he did allow some fishing there, but that's going to be all shut off now too. Uh, Clint, I'm, I'm up to Brian Anderson here on Upper Lost Creek. I could be wrong, but isn't a good por por portion of that owned by Deseret Land and Livestock? Uh, uh, yeah, so there's a, and so the way it goes from the dam, um, above the reservoir, there's like above the reservoir, there's just a tiny little stretch of the creek that's on BOR and then it's all on Deseret. Below the dam, it goes Bureau of Reclamation. There's a piece that is Deseret's, then it went to Ovard's, and then Deseret bought the, the same piece that's a, between Ovard's and the dam was in the Hell Canyon CWMU from Toons. And when they sold the CWMU, when they sold the property that was in Hell's Canyon, they sold that bottom piece as well. So now it goes BOR, Deseret, uh, the new landowner and then Deseret below that. Has Deseret historically cooperated with walk-in access? Uh, no. <laughs> they they have not. Um, it took Rachel like eight months to get the operator to call her back to even have a contract for that piece that's just below the dam. They've never had the piece below Ovard's in. I was working with the tunes trying to get that to work in. We were it was a trial and error piece right there below the dam. They wanted to see how it would work out. If it worked out all right, they would enroll that other three quarters of a mile, mile and a quarter, something like that. I, I can't remember how much it was. It's a pretty good little chunk. And that's when he, uh, for the second time, got in, or third time, got into stage four cancer and they sold the property. So um, we lost that opportunity. Like there's just nothing I can do. So, um, but Deseret guides on that lower piece, or at least that's what they've told us. So, 
and then they guide above the reservoir as well. I'm curious if uh, the, this this um, significant change, loss of walk-in access parcels, um, extends beyond the northern region. I know Jackie's still on. Um, it seems like walk-in access is uh, for for angler concerns is really um, it's really been dramatically beneficial in the northern region and central region too, but especially northern region. So, Jackie, did you have any comments regarding loss of access uh, to Blue Ribbon or what might be considered Blue Ribbon um, candidate? So, short answer, no. And for a couple of reasons, you know, we don't have a lot of Blue Ribbon waters and the Blue Ribbon waters we have fortunately have plenty of public access. Um, and obviously, like I said earlier, we don't really have any candidate waters in mind. Um, the other part of the answer to that question is our walk-in access is um, mostly run through outreach with Mike Packer being the lead on that. And so I don't have the involvement with that program that say Clint does in the Northern region. I just, I'm not as familiar with it. Okay, I'm thinking of waters like Thistle Creek perhaps or some something like that. There's definitely access issues on Thistle Creek. We have lost access, um, but Thistle Creek is not one that I would consider even a potential blue ribbon water. Fair enough. Um, and Nick, I recall um, at one point in time, we were evaluating uh, the Beaver River, below Beaver and above the town of, uh, what's the reservoir? Minersville. Minersville. What's the status there? Um, so nothing's really changed in terms of um access through there uh there's kind of two there's some blm land and then the private land is owned by two different groups one is the local irrigation company bought a bunch of land in there and they're signed up through walk-in access and i don't see that changing at all <clears throat> and then there's a property owner right below the dam that owns a section um and he's an older gentleman but i don't see that changing in the near future he's we're actually going to do some restoration work on his property in the next couple of years. And so that it, it should stay open. And uh, Upper Severe, AC, Mammoth. I know Mammoth changed recently. Relatively. Yeah, so as far as Blue Ribbon Waters go, nothing, that, nothing should, should change. We've definitely um, seen, I don't know, I, I guess I can't say for sure, but it sure seems to me like since the COVID stuff that we've seen more property being sold and bought, especially um, in rural areas, a lot of people from California and stuff buying up pieces of property. Uh, but so far there haven't been any major reductions in access or anything like that. Um, Mammoth Creek's one that it never changed property owners. Um, it was kind of a, it'd been left open to hunting or open to fishing the family kind of always had it open to fishing um but my understanding is there was something with a, a animal being being taken on a hunt that the family wasn't you know very excited about and um because it wasn't posted there wasn't really anything they could do about it and so they closed it to everything um so that's one that we're kind of slowly trying to work our way towards maybe a walk-in access somewhere down the road yeah, it's similar to a situation I think on at Mountain Green, uh, where there was hunting off of the highway there that caused the landowner, and Clint can correct me if I'm wrong, but caused the landowner there to take their parcel out of walk-in access. Um, I don't know if any other regions, if there's been an impact. Um, there's no question there's been a lot of turnover of land 
and you do wonder about new owners um, not having any desire to to carry on with walk-in access. And I wonder if there's a need to increase the benefit to the landowner to make a greater incentive to keep keep uh, historical walk-in access parcels in the program. Any thoughts about that? All right. Well, I know we've gone a little bit of field on, on the access situation, and I want to bring it back to Candidate Water's scoring process and scores. Um, you know, I made a point, and I'm not sure if Cal's still on, but I made a point of asking Cal whether he had gotten sufficient feedback and, and whether Jordan had talked to him about our decisions specific to, um, to blending number four and our rating system and our thumbs up, thumbs down vote to not um, not approve of blending number four. Um, and I basically wanted to make sure he was okay with that. And it sounded like everybody understands the situation pretty clearly. What I, um, what I do wonder generally from the council is, what did everybody think of that process? That That is the first time where we've added this last uh, step after rating waters using this quasi semi objective uh, Hepworth Walker scale. We then put it to the council on a thumbs up, thumbs down, basically allowing ourselves to overrule the scale, uh, the quasi objective scale and um, make a final determination. And I'll, I'll open it up to, to, to the regional biologist too, because I know Jackie was um, concerned and it looks like Ken's got something to say about that. So go ahead, Ken. Well, I, I just look at the fact that it would have passed had we stuck with the, the scale that we use, Hepworth Walker, Walker scale. And yet it was, I believe it was unanimous or close to unanimous on the thumbs down because of the situation there. And, and I really think that was the proper procedure that we needed to use. I, and that's my feeling. I, those that have visited it, those that have seen what the pro, uh, the, the, the situation is there. Uh, I like the way we did it. Bert, I'm, this is Rex. I, I, I'm with Ken completely on this. I, after being to those two waters within just a short period of time and both scoring about the same, but for me, I, there wasn't, I, I think we destroy that fishery, that blanding number four, if we were to make a blue ribbon. I just don't think it can take that pressure. Whereas Lost Creek, I, I'm, I'm glad Kent or that uh, Clint spent the time and, and the effort because to me, that that really was one that, that could be listed as blue ribbon. So I was for the process. Any other comments? Uh, from yeah, the, uh, uh, Bert, Larry Finch here. Um, I like the process. I think it's good to have an objective, uh, you know, the objective scale, but then there should be opinion in the thing too. Um, uh, you know, that it, that's a little more subjective. And, you know, it gives everybody kind of a chance to voice their opinion. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Jackie, you have your hand up. I, negative Nancy here. <laughs> I, I appreciate the flexibility of the process, but I still hesitate because I worry about hitting a moving target and just the what's the word i'm looking for kind of the continuation of the process with institutional knowledge you know new council members bring new blood bring new opinions and so what didn't make it as a blue ribbon fishery last year could easily make it next year with three new council members and i just worry about the consistency of that um, but i do appreciate the flexibility and i do think opinions matter um it shouldn't be as rigid as as the scale i guess 
Yeah, and I would add to that. Um, I was pretty wedded to the scale. I thought, you know, this they put a lot. There's been a lot of effort put into the scale over the years. So I felt like, why would we even want to have a thumbs up, thumbs down? We shouldn't. We just let the the, the values, the scores, determine the outcome. But um, the council felt differently, and I honored that, and I saw the wisdom in that, and I think it played out pretty well. But we've got some comments. Looks like Clint has his hand raised and then Randy next. So, you know, I can see exactly where Jackie's coming from. It is hard to hit a moving target. Um, I will say this, that looking at the two scores and having, you know, Lost Creek be listed as a Blue Ribbon fishery and planning for not, um, I was a little nervous. You know, there's been a lot of time and there's been a lot of effort on my part and my counterparts um, in the office to make some changes. Um, and Jackie's right, like having three or four new members or, you know, even just one that's very vocal um, can be a little overwhelming at times, you know, and um, it's nice to have some good open minds kind of look at things and, and take the value that we as biologists hopefully have you know, show in our in our presentations and the information that we share. Um, but it is a little unnerving not knowing that the score is the ultimate end, you know, um, after you put some effort in. Um, so, but I'm glad that it has, I, I'm also glad that it has some flexibility there because I think your the gut feeling of, the group was that Lost Creek was good, but the gut feeling about Blanding was maybe not that the fishery, but the situation and everything that was around it was not what the council wanted to have. And I thought that was kind of a nice opportunity to have a different vote. That and concerns about hot spotting it through blue ribbon designation where it might not handle increase visitorship. Uh, I think Randy had his hand up next and then Jordan. I think it's the other way. I'll let Jordan go first and then I'll, I'll chime in. All right, Jordan. I think the process showed um, some room for improvement in our ranking criteria. I think it's probably too easy to become a blue ribbon fishery in Utah. Um, Utah, has the most robust blue ribbon fisheries program of any state in the country. Um, I think we're the only ones that have a council that actually reviews what a blue ribbon fishery is. And so we need to be make sure that we're the leaders in providing what is truly a blue ribbon fishery. Um, just today, looking through some websites, I pulled up California's. They've got 10 that they label as blue ribbon fisheries in their entire state. They're all rivers. Uh, Wyoming also has 10. Again, all rivers are creeks. Montana has four, all rivers. Um, you know, just so, so we're not, we're not having a consistent um, definition um, with, with what other states around us are doing. And that's okay. I don't care as long as we know what we want to label a blue or a ribbon fishery, and then we make it so that you know that fishery really earned that title, and it's not just because of a ranking criteria that fits a fits a definition in it, and it uh, and it truly is the highest quality that we offer. I seem to remember krill surveys uh, from the Provo, Middle Provo River exceeding the blue ribbon standards for a Wyoming fisheries. So <laughs> maybe there's something to the fact that we have some pretty healthy fisheries. No, now, I think we do. I think we have yeah. some amazing places to fish, but I think that blue ribbon fisheries uh, should be offering up the best of the best. Um, yeah, it goes back to the to the saying that that we throw around that Dustin Carlson liked to use, and that's if if everything's special, nothing is special. So let's make sure that 
blue ribbon fisheries are really special. Right. I was going to mention that. So, so, Rand, so to yeah. me, it means the ranking criteria needs to be improved and maybe our definition needs to be revisited. All right. Fair enough. Randy, you are next and then Ken. I was going to say something. I think kind of similar to what Jordan just said, but I, I think the gold standard to this is the ranking criteria. I think we need a very, you know, kind of objective way to evaluate our fisheries where we can apply a consistent standard. I think what we've seen over the last two years is the reason we went to this approach is because the current rating system just isn't working. And yeah, I, I don't know where to go from here. I don't know if I want to throw it out because there's a lot of, a lot of great concepts in there. But I think probably at some point we need to look at that and see if there's some, some tweaks that we can make that, uh, you know, create still a very kind of objective process, but also creates a process that you, the final scoring also kind of aligns with what our guts tell us. So, you know, we're able to score and pro provide a very consistent standard that isn't going to be swayed by a few people, but it's also defendable. Ken, I'm not sure if you have further comment. Yeah, yes, I, I agree with what Randy and Jordan have said. I just want to push one thing, and that's the fact that when we rate a blue ribbon water, our name as council members should be on that in some way we're sticking we're sticking uh the rating to our name and it should be important that it is a blue ribbon water and and, and agreed with jordan that we may need to relook at a few things fair enough clint uh, your hands up i'm not sure if it's still up Sorry, I didn't know if I when I turned it on, if it would turn on. That was the first time I've tried it, so I will take it off. That's quite a right. Well, I'm hearing there's room for improvement, and uh, I, I don't deny that. I don't think any scale is perfect. I'm also hearing, hearing Dustin Carlson. <laughs> Everything's special, nothing's special. I agree with that. And Ken, I agree that in some sense, you know, we put our names and our reputations on, is this really and truly a blue ribbon fishery? And we should be critical and we should make sure that uh, it meets uh, our standards for certain, although we will disagree for various reasons. So we have to figure out some way to come to consensus. And I guess that actually is the motivation behind the whole thumbs up, thumbs down is that's kind of the final consensus. That's the final check. So um, at any rate, uh, are there further comments regarding water evaluation and scoring process or further comments regarding waters that maybe you think uh, are not really blue ribbon, but are on the list? I'll just say one thing. If we rework our, our scoring scale and we talk about blue ribbon really being the best of the best, then maybe this idea that there might be a higher standard out there we need to hold some more waters for or hold some more waters too. As we look at reevaluating waters, that will kind of complicate that, make that a little more challenging, I think, because we're going to have to take a more in-depth look at some of these waters. We're kind of at a point where I think we've got 40-something blue ribbon fisheries. We're talking about, I don't think we're going to have much more in terms of the blue ribbon fisheries long term. So we're going to have to take a real hard look, not just the new waters, but the waters we have. Fair enough. Any new members of the council want to comment? Any thoughts? Dave has a comment. I also think blue ribbon status reflects the tremendous efforts of the biologists. Yes, I agree. I'm reading that off the chat feature. Did you have any further thoughts on that, Dave? Not really. I just think, you know, Clint comes to mind recently with all the efforts he made into getting that blue ribbon. Uh, all the biologists, you know, put forth a lot of effort into achieving what we're labeling blue ribbon, and I think they're doing a great job. I mean, you look at Lake Powell, for instance, and all the effort Wayne's put in over the years, and 
creating such a tremendous fishery down there. I just, I just think if they're going to put in the effort, then we should put it through the process and, and give them the nod if it's, if it's worthy of it. I'll kind of build on that. I think, I think it means something as well that we have biologists who want to the read the Blue River Bar with their waters. For now, you know, we look at Clint with Lost Creek, for example, you know, that's something he was aiming for for a few years there and worked hard on that fishery. And I think we see that in other regions as well. So I think that is a good thing that our brand, you know, means a lot to the biologists and the fact that they want their waters to get there if they can. Ken, you raised your hand again. Yes, I just, I want, I want to look at a little bit different. Clint did so much work, but not only did Clint work, but the county up there got involved I went in uh, before the road was fixed and seen what it was, but the county put forth an effort. And I think that's a little different than than on Blanding number four, where they definitely wanted it, and for financial reasons too, but they, they were not willing to put forth the effort that Morgan County did and Clint did and the surrounding uh, individuals did. Yeah, fair enough. I I wonder how many fisheries biologists um, get a class in their training on um, how to talk to county councils <laughs> and pitch uh, engineering programs. And it just seems like uh, there's so many uh, moving parts. And and of course, Lost Creek was was a big one, and Clint's still working on it and still trying to open up more shoreline to access and still working with Bureau of Reclamation. Um, but it's a good, good point. Jordan, you have your hand up. So there are going to be some cases like Lost Creek where we put in a lot of effort to try and make it a blue ribbon fishery. But there are certain characteristics of, of blue ribbon fisheries that it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to get the water there. So um, I, 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 kudos to Clint, but, uh, you know, some efforts are not going to be sustainable over the long term. And some of those, some of these waters are not going to maintain a blue ribbon status without a lot of effort. So uh, I think if it's not sustainable, then it's not a blue ribbon fishery. Yeah, and essentially that's what Drew was asking us to consider when he made those points about climate change and reduced precipitation. Clint, your hand is up. Well, I think, um, and, and thanks Jordan um, and and Dave and, and you guys, um, it's definitely not my effort that has done this. I mean, I've had a lot of support in the office and, and through the partners, but Jordan hits a is a really key point is how much additional effort does a biologist or two or three or four have to do in order to keep it at a at a certain level that makes it right. And that's that's where we're at here in the region. You know, we could we could put a lot of time and effort and money and whatever else into Echo, but we still have it drawn down to 25% at the end of the fall. Right. And you just can't have a 25% pool of water and try to make a fishery as good as it really could be if you only dropped it, you know, sem from from 100% to 20 75% or something like that. Right. So um, that's where we're at. And I think that's kind of the next thing. I think if we got 40 in the state, who knows? Maybe we'll make it to 45. But I think what we have right now is now it's maintain and build those fisheries that we have and and just make them better make make changes to to make those better so they really do stick out yes wyoming and, and those others have fewer but i think we have stayed pretty true to to the scales and and the things that we use for for ranking these um and i think the ones that are still there are, are probably worthy of of that designation now we just got to keep them you know, and, and just keep working towards them. And it is amazing how places like Fish Lake has this long and storied history. Um, there have been 
biological impacts. Milfoil has dramatically changed the shore angling experience, pretty much eliminated it there. Um, but, you know, you turn around and you realize the facilities are completely subpar. And so all of a sudden it's time to really invest in bringing Fish Lake up to speed and up to snuff. I mean, it's still a fantastic fishery. It still has those huge max and um, it still has a wonderful perch population, uh, which supports that perch tournament every year. But um, building, I think, includes infrastructure improvements as well as uh, habitat improvements. So I think all of those things are true. But as to Jordan's point, limited water is going to be more and more of a problem um, going forward. So something to keep in mind. Any further comments on uh, the water scoring process or additional waters to consider? or factors, or I suppose we could reserve for a future meeting how, what sorts of adjustments we want to make. Maybe I can ask the council to keep thinking about um, what sorts of adjustments we might want to make based on our ex experiences from November. Anybody else? Randy? Yes, yeah, quick question. Are you talking adjustments or scoring process? I'm just looking for clarification. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I moved from building and infrastructure to adjustments. And what I meant was adjustments and scoring. Yes. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that's a good conversation to have at some point. What I was almost wondering is I might be able to kind of look back at historic scores that water's received and see if there's anything we can glean from that. We might be able to tease out maybe certain components of the scoring, for example, that seem to be especially problematic and those might might target some areas for discussions down the road. All right, fair enough. Well, it's 2.30. The next item on the agenda is um, Chairman Steering Committee report. And uh, we did have a steering committee this morning. It was a half hour uh, in advance of this meeting. And I had put together a, a separate agenda for that steering committee. And the number one item was succession planning. Um, and we can, there's some good ideas came out of this. Steering com committees comprised of Randy, me, George as vice chair, and Rex as head of the outreach committee. Um, but again, the point I've made for some time now, I will be, my, my six years will be up in June and George's will as well. So we're gonna need a chair and a vice chair. Um, I actually asked Rex whether he'd be willing to consider being chair, and he said he would really prefer to stay uh, as chair of outreach. Um, we've also talked a little bit this morning about making these kind of um, a revolving or a, a a progressing thing and we could conceivably even combine uh, the waters committee with the vice chair and then allow that person once they've served in those positions to just automatically advance to chair um, but the problem is we don't have people stepping up and saying they want to take on these additional responsibilities so uh, that's the way it goes um, I, I i think we're almost to the point of telling people that they're going to be chair, <laughs> but we don't want to take it to that level. Um, for the most part, council members, you know, your initial term is three years. You serve those three years, and there's essentially an option for you to, um, <laughs> there is an option for you to step away uh, at that point, but usually people continue on for another three years. So it's usually, usually ends up being a six, uh, a, a six year stint. And um, I greatly appreciated Dustin uh, when I became chair hanging around and helping me out for a month or two. It didn't take too long to get up to speed because there wasn't all that much. Plus I had served as waters committee chair during a time when there was some conflict over waters. Um, and I just 
So we had a question regarding what's happened with Meg, and I'd raised the same point. So Meg Birdsey is uh, one of our two warm water representatives, and I know she was changing jobs and becoming a teacher. I can only imagine that COVID uh, made that a more challenging um, transition uh, between careers and, and jobs. So I don't know. She's not been responding and so I would I may reach out to her one more time and say maybe we should ask you to step down uh, because we we could use another warm water representative so um Randy I don't know if you had something to say but does anyone have a strong desire to step up and do more either as a waters committee chair or uh, the chair of the organization All right, crickets. Uh, Randy, did you have something to say? <laughs> Larry raised his hand. What do you have to say, Larry? Well, uh, you know, just being here for 18 months and then the initial COVID, you know, thing here, I, I, I don't feel qualified, certainly, to step into a, uh, the leadership role, but I sure would like to get more involved in the outreach uh, for Rex so that, you know, if he wants to rotate off or, you know, at some future point in time, I think that'd be a a, a good way for me to help me learn more. Uh, uh, you know, it's been an informative first year and a half, uh, even with the struggle. So, you know, I, I, I'd like to get more involved. And, and I think that's something that I could, I could help out with. And, you know, I've got a 35 year career in sales and marketing. So, and I'm, I'm semi-retired. I, I get a little busy in the winter with my ski instruction. But other than that, you know, I've, I've got plenty of time to, to, de to dedicate to some some additional projects. So that that's what I really what I wanted to say. Well, I know for me, I'd be delighted, Larry, to have you come and work with me. And I think with Crystal and uh, I, I think we'd probably make a pretty good dynamic trio together and certainly some things we can do. So I, from my point, I'd, I'd, I'd be delighted. Thank you. And one thing we did talk about this morning is having a vice outreach chair. And it sounds like maybe you're willing to step into that position, Larry. And that puts two people in that position. I think what that does is it gives Rex a hand. And also, you know, we got somebody, uh, you know, newer in the council and Larry who could learn the ropes a little bit. And if he chooses to take the chair position when Rex leaves the council, you know, it makes a nice natural progression. Yeah, I, I'd be, I'd certainly be happy to take on that responsibility. That's great. That sounds good. And as I said, I, I almost look at this year as being more of an outreach year than a waters evaluation year, just given the fact that, you know, we've essentially identified all the blue ribbon fisheries to date. Um, and then, so there's only one to evaluate. So we might as well do more to let the public know about what it is that we do about our projects, as well as the existing waters. Um, okay, I am, I don't know, Randy, you have more to say regarding chair and succession? I was, I was gonna say, we need two people, quite frankly. We need this vice chair position, who I think it could double as the waters committee chair, and we need a replacement for Bert. And we need it soon because Bert is leaving here in another, I don't know, five months, something like that. And I, I think having somebody in that position where, you know, Bert could, you know, I guess, you know, lend some assistance for a couple months so they can learn the ropes, I think is a very valuable thing. So I guess what I would like is um, everybody to think about it. And I think we need to have nominations and a vote at our next meeting. So really consider if is something you can take on. What I'm going to do is I've already got kind of a laundry list going over here that I'm going to send out to the council. I think one of the top priorities I'm going to work with Bert here and kind of get a written list of the responsibilities so people know what they're getting into if they were to volunteer for the chair or vice chair position, the time commitment, et cetera. And then I, I think we also tossed around internally in the steering committee some names so we might talk to a few people and see if we can drum up some interest. But I, I really feel like next meeting, this needs to come to an end. We need to leave the next meeting with those positions filled. So think about it. And like I said, I'll get some information together. I, I think this is something where 
I, I think there's some apprehension because I think people are concerned about commitments associated with this. I, I'm not sure it's as much of a commitment as people think. And I think when we put out on paper, people will see a little bit better what the responsibilities are. And we'll see that it's not much more than, you know, attending a meeting in the first place. Brian, Randy, this is, oh, sorry. This is Brian, I'm, I'm, I think I'm the newest member, so I'm really green. I've, I don't even know what the water chair is, <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy, you know, I, I'd like to contribute and and do something. I, I don't. I think somebody as green as me stepping into the chairmanship is probably a train wreck. But uh, I could certainly serve on water committees or, or chair some some committee and kind of learn as I go. But I'm, I'm pretty green, but I'm willing to do more. And Randy, honestly, the oh sorry, Randy. Oh, uh, just one of the things that we talked about this morning in our meeting was that. Uh, try to make it so it's rotating so you don't come in and I mean I, I think it's great Brian that you do that but if you come in and that's your next six years you know that's that's a long time to be in that rotation whereas if we could do this where we do a, maybe a waters committee and then rotate in so it's a two-year commitment and then rotate through like that that was one of the things we talked about and I think that makes a big difference but when, when you know you're looking at I mean you got somebody like Brian's like holy cow, I got six years ahead of me if I take this on or, you know, you get a Russ or a Jordan or just, you know, um, maybe by doing it this way, we get that two years in, so. And that was exactly the thought we would have, is not turn this into a standing position like we have right now, but just a two-year rotation. So you're assistant chair for a year and then chair for the next year and then you're done with those positions. Um, I can get with you, Brian, more if you're interested in the water uh, committee position. I, th I think you saw when Bert kind of led the discussion earlier about candidate waters, exactly what that's all about. It's kind of this time of year, figuring out, going with the regions and asking them what waters they think are potential blue ribbon fisheries. And then through the year, just kind of reminding people during our meetings that they need to go out and visit these waters and then help wrangle the scores at the end of the year for these. Um, and honestly, for all these positions, I'm here. My job is to be the liaison. My job is to make basically your job easier. So a lot of this is, you know, the, the, the coordination, the, the electronic part of it, setting up meetings, spreadsheets, collecting scores, that's stuff I've traditionally done. So we're basically looking for someone to kind of work behind the scenes and moderate some of it. I suppose we could always double the salary. Which is nothing times two. Um, at any rate, uh, okay. Other items from this morning's meeting, um, I didn't really get a chance to 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 say too much about it during steering committee, but I am uh, very delighted with what's happened with respect to outreach, and I pointed out the changes to the fishing guidebook. If you haven't picked up a 2021 fishing guidebook, I encourage you to do so. Take a look at that blue ribbon page. Take a look at um, the little blue ribbon logos. Take a look at the website as well. If you haven't, it's just wonderful to be able to uh, to drill down on, on our blue ribbon fishery. So it's been a great year for outreach. We'll talk just a little bit more about, about outreach programs in, in a minute. Um, but I mentioned this in the steering committee meeting and I'm not sure if I mentioned it in this meeting but with this increase in angling pressure and increase in license sales, um, you know, it would be, uh, it wouldn't make sense if Blue Ribbon didn't get a slightly larger slice of the pie. Well, same size slice of the pie, but more dollars when there's substantially more licenses sold. So uh, Randy and I were, talking a little bit about that while well, the steering committee was talking a little bit about that. Randy, did you want to say anything about that? Is there any chance that we'll have a bigger budget for this year's projects, for example? I think you're trying to make me promise something that I can't promise, but <laughs> I, I think the guy I need to talk to is Mike Canning in the director's office. He's the one that sets all the division budgets and he's the one who determines kind of the, the piece of the pie that, uh, that every kind of component of the division receives budget wise. Uh, this is a portion of the license dollars, you know, portions of the license dollars get allocated to other places like fish hatcheries, for example. And we just need to work out the piece that's the blue ribbon piece. 
And what I was telling Bird earlier is I need to schedule a meeting with Mike to talk about a few other things. I think it'd be a perfect opportunity. I'm probably gonna have to meet with Mike in the next month or, or so. So I put on my list as something to talk to him about and see what we can do moving forward. I'm gonna stop short of making a motion, but I'll ask the council, uh, is anyone opposed to the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council getting more money to fulfill its objectives and to uh, pursue these projects to improve, maintain, and enhance our Blue Ribbon Fisheries? I don't know whether to say aye or nay. <laughs> I'm saying, are, is anybody opposed to it? <laughs> Me. I'm not actually making a motion. I, my point is <laughs> to tell Randy that the entire council feels like, hey, wait a minute, there's no question there's greater numbers of anglers out there utilizing our resource. No question there are more licenses have been sold. So um, be nice to see some of that come our way. Jordan, your mic is on. I'm not sure if you have a comment. Didn't did, when when they formed the Blue Ribbon Council, didn't they add a dollar to the licenses for Blue Ribbon Fisheries? That's how it started out. Randy, you want to clarify the situation? Is, is it not that way at all anymore? I don't think it is that way. I think I think originally when they came up with the budget, they just arbitrarily said we'll give a dollar per license sale. That's how they set the initial budget, and I, they haven't touched it since. So I don't think it was ever put firmly. You know, it's going to go up and down with license sales. It was just this is where we're going to set our starting point. It seems fair, and they just stuck with it since. Gotcha. Yeah, budgets are a lot more predictable when it's the same number every year. But this is ridiculous. We got twice as many licenses sold. What do you know the numbers, Randy? Sorry, muted myself. It's about fifteen percent more. Okay, not fifty, not a hundred percent more, but fifteen percent more. So that's not as large as I thought. Certainly, more people are ice fishing. That's for sure. <laughs> that much. I no, know. but I mean, our. Our current budget's four hundred fifty thousand. That fifteen percent might make it five hundred thousand. Which I mean, that's another project or two funded, and also five hundred thousand. That's half a million. It kind of it kind of sounds like a nice number for some reason. Okay, that's your talking point, Randy. <laughs> half <laughs> a million that. dollars. <laughs> it's a nice round number. Work with it. <laughs> um, okay, I'm being silly here. It's getting late in the day. Um, the only other things we were meant to talk about were outreach, and we'll get to that in just a second. It'd be great to see more involvement with, uh, as we discussed, social media, just to further promote Blue Ribbon throughout the state. And um, sounds like we're going to start working towards the reevaluation process um, at the next meeting. So there'll be more discussions regarding that. And um, I think that was it from the steering committee. So moving on, outreach committee, Rex, maybe there are a few things you wanted to hit on um, in addition I, to what we talked about. I think we pretty much covered what we want to do in the schedule that we've got. One of the things that we did talk about is that um, finding out that we start working with maybe some of the little smaller retailers because it, <laughs> When you have Sportsman's and Cabela's and, and Bass Pro Shops are all the same now, um, I sorry, Mike, um, then it might be maybe we can reach even more anglers if we reach out maybe some of the smaller groups. And of course, maybe if we get more interaction and Mike Fisher could address this from this big group, then we're okay. But I did reach out to the Department of Commerce for the state of Utah, and they're putting together a list of all the stores in Utah that sells uh, fishing fishing equipment, not fishing licenses. So hopefully at the next meeting, I'll be able to report with that. And I've reached out to Larry in the background while we're having this meeting and see maybe if Larry and I can put that together. If uh, if everybody's okay with Larry and I working together, I, I don't know if we need to put that to a vote or what that needs to happen, but I'm I'm certainly all for being able to work with Larry. I like the uh, idea, Randy. Any formal vote needed, you think? 
or uh, shall we give him the go ahead? I'm thinking we don't need a formal vote for this, so I say we just give him a go ahead if he he's good with it. We got TJ's thumbs up, so we're good. He's an oh, he's a retired yeah. attorney. <laughs> All right, so that's Bobby. what I've got. I'll get I'll get this stuff from the Department of Commerce and and in the meantime, uh, reach out and and talk to Crystal and and uh, see what we can put in place. But uh, we certainly have some neat resources. We did have a couple of additional ideas, and Rex, you've mentioned them in the past. Uh, the short videos that came up in our conversation with Crystal, which she's saying it's better if they're not short <laughs> now. Uh, maybe five minute, ten minutes, something like that, and I gather that's so that they they can be interrupted to sell ads. You can't do that with a short video, but um, so that's an area where council members can contribute. Um, I'm gonna take pictures the next time I get out ice fishing, for example. There were a few items of swag where we wanted to make use of the blue ribbon logo, um, and while we're uh, while I'm thinking of it, Ken and I are wearing the official Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council shirts, and we haven't had a run of these in like three years, so it may be time to investigate that. Although I gather there was some controversy in some of the old members, some of the original members are like, what are you doing spending money on shirts and name tags and such? But I don't, we did- I, Sorry, sorry, Bert. Don't Go have ahead. more name tags, obviously, but I, I do have extra shirts. And I don't know if it's enough to supply everyone with one, but they're around if we want them. Yeah, well, the new members should get shirts for sure. And, uh, you know, at one point in time, we talked about maybe wearing the shirts when you're going to evaluate a water or something like that. But I've kind of kept a lower profile than that. But how big is the inventory, Randy? I'm not sure. I haven't been to my office for a long time now, <laughs> but I, I want to say it's in the, the 10 to 15 shirt range. We definitely bought extras last time, so they may be all crazy sizes. I'm not sure off the top of my head what sizes I have available, but I think what I could do is I, I could try to get my hands on those shirts and then, you know, take, take an order and then get it in the mail, people's shirts. That's something we could certainly do. Yeah, all the new folks. So the other three items were, we talked about two different charts, a hatch chart uh, with uh, branded with blue ribbon logo, a water temperature chart for flat water, uh, and also a key float, key fob blue ribbon logo. And these were things that we would give out traditionally at in-person seminars. So there's not, a huge amount of urgency, but there is a possibility of, um, you know, Rex mentioned reaching out to various shops, uh, fishing tackle dealers, and we could uh, get the word out by providing a small inventory of these charts or float cushions to these shops to be given away. Um, I have no idea when our next in-person public event is going to be. I really doubt it's going to be before the end of summer. And look, Randy's going to introduce the newest Opplinger to the to the crew here. Who do you got there, Randy? Show us, show them to us. Oh, this is Jack, our, our new baby. He's two months old. Sorry, my wife had to go get our other kids from preschool, and I have to kind of babysit, and he got fussy. So. A man multitasking. Look at that. Most women would never believe it, but anyway, do we still have Jackie on? <laughs> I better stop going down that yes, path. Yes, I was just going to say, I believe it's called parenting now, not babysitting, Randy. You're official. <laughs> <laughs> Got my terminology wrong. You're right. <laughs> All right. Well, nicely done, uh, Randy. So happy you, your little guy has joined us. So <laughs> hopefully he's not too fussy. Um, and any other uh, outreach? Rex, are we good? We're, we're good, Bert. All we, right. I'll get with Larry and we'll get with Crystal and try to have something in place by the next meeting for you. At least find out what the Chamber of Commerce has got and then see what we can go from there. I, like you said, till we can start meeting in person, uh, 
getting some of the little bit of swag stuff isn't quite as critical. Yeah, it's low priority. And Brian, I'm happy to reach out to you to tell you more about the Waters Committee and uh, what's involved there and tell you a little bit about the history of that committee. Um, I had some other things I wanted to chat with you about anyway. Um, any additional new business from the council? I would encourage uh since we are likely to i'm going to reach out to meg we may be needing a warm water representative uh so if you all have any folks in mind that like to fish for warm water species um now is the time to start talking to them about possibly serving on the council so I'm not saying we're gonna replace meg right away but i just need to hear from her and see how she's doing and whether she whether she could ever get back with us or she's just totally swamped with her new career. Okay, I think that's it for today. Um, we routinely have these meetings on the third Thursday of the month. The next one is scheduled for Thursday, February 18th. Um, and I think at that point in time, we're going to begin talking about projects um, and introducing especially new members of the council to the WRI website and just let folks know what we do when we go through the evaluation process. It's uh, been streamlined quite a lot through Randy's efforts to, to, uh, to, to make it uh, electronically scored, which has been tremendous compared to back when we started with pens and papers and uh, trying to keep up with the pitches that we hear from uh, the biologists um, that are submitting the proposals for funding. Um, so that'll be next month. And unless there's anything else, any any further comments, any thoughts, final thoughts? Randy? Uh, the third, yeah, a couple things out. So the March meeting is our project scoring meeting. Next month, we'll kind of just prep you for that because that's a little bit different meeting than we traditionally have. And then I'll be sending out probably a flurry of emails in the next week or so. There's kind of some tasks that landed on my 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 hands here that came out of today's meeting. So I'll get that social media schedule sent out here in the next week or two. Get that kind of water reevaluation plan, that schedule I talked about, kind of put out. We can talk about those things the next meeting. I'll also come up with these position responsibilities so people sort of know time commitments and what you do if you're the chairperson, the water committee chair, that kind of thing. And I'll get all that stuff out soon so we can talk about it more in the next meeting. Awesome. Thanks. All right, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for joining. Looks like we will adjourn. Uh, Jackie says, thanks for another great discussion. Have a great weekend. So we will adjourn until Thursday, February 18th, but be looking for emails from Randy. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Stay well. Michael, I'll get with you whenever you'd like. Hey. Yeah. That's great, Rex. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, everyone.